What's up guys? It's yo boy on the sensei. Welcome to What If I Was Reborn in Naruto as Uchiha and Uzumaki Hybrid. Part 2, like, share, and comment on the video. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't subscribed. Also remember to check out the original story, link in the description. With all that out of the way, enjoy. In an office in the Hokage building, some of Kanoha's jounins assembled with an air of expectancy. The Hokage sat at the head of a large wooden desk cluttered with scrolls and maps. His gaze swept across the faces of the assembled jounins as the office echoed with subdued murmurs. With the recent graduation of new genins into the shinobi ranks of Kanoha, the jounin sensei selected beforehand had to deliberate the different team formations. The decisions made here today would change the lives of many shinobi, the genins as well as their soon-to-be sensei, forever. Due to the low number of jounins, especially those who were qualified and willing to teach the next generations, the genins who would not make the cut would be sent to the genin reserve. The lingering tension in the office found a momentary respite as the door creaked open, heralding the arrival of the latecomer. The eyes of the assembled jounins turned towards the entrance. He is always punctual, so why was he late today? Sarutobi Goya wondered. The person was close to the Hokage so it was strange that he would be late to such a meeting. Good to see that you joined us today, the Hokage greeted the Jounin with a nod. The late arrival took a leisurely path towards his designated seat. He had just returned to the village after a week-long mission and was too tired to care what the rest thought about his tardiness. Now that we are all here, we can begin. Hiruzen declared as his gaze fell on a figure in the room. The figure was Narashiba. Narashiba was the venerable head of the Nara clan and the current Jounin commander. He carried an air that spoke the weight of experience and leadership he held. A cascade of black hair framed his face with eyes that surveyed the world with a discerning gaze. Despite the passing years, there was a subtle glint in those eyes that hinted at a mind still sharp and a spirit undiminished. If Renjiro saw him, he would mistake him with his son Shikaku Nara as he was his spitting image, only lacking the scars the latter had. You all know why we are here, he began, so let's get straight into it. We have fewer Jounins available to guide the Genins this time. So we will have to put more effort into turning them into Chunins as quickly as possible. I had already prepared a list. I will first read it out then you can raise any objections or recommendations you have. Team 1, Hyuga Hiro, Shimura Miki, and Uchiha Inabi. The Jounin responsible for them will be. Team 2, Team 5, Senju Mahara, Kamaya Yoshihiro, and Chiharu Obi. The Jounin responsible for them will be Akihiro Kudo. Team 8, Abure Minabi, Karama Kusai, and Suzuki Miramito. The Jounin responsible for them will be Hisaki Tano. Team 10, Ono Inazuka, Hyuga Fukui, and Abure Manze. The Jounin responsible for them will be Karama Sando. Team 13, Akimichi Cho, Yamanaka Iwai, and Nara. The Jounin responsible for them will be Sarutobi Goya. So that only leaves six students and two Jounins. We left these spots open as we thought it would be better to discuss this with you all. The names are Marino Ibiki, Nakamura Aiko, Aburame Hiroko, Uzumaki Renjiro, Achiha Teka, and Hataki Hiro. The reason we haven't decided on the combinations is that we could either form a normal assault team or form a task-specific team. So I will let you guys decide this. I think Ibiki Marino, Hiroko Aburame and Teka Uchiha would be a perfect team for intelligence gathering with Shimura Yamanaka as their Jounin Sensei. That leaves the rest a good assault team. Maeda Inazuka added. That is exactly what I thought but we already have another team with a similar composition. Anyway, it wouldn't hurt to have two teams with the same objective. Shiba surmised. Good, so that leaves Uzumaki Renjiro, Hataki Hiro, and Nakamura Aiko as Team 15. They were from the same year so that would help in their team coordination. Shimura and Riku, are you okay with this? Yes, Shimura Yamanaka answered, while Riku simply nodded. That's it for this year. 
Unfortunately, the Sanins would not be taking in teams this year due to other responsibilities. Lady Tsunade and Lord Orochimaru are busy in the hospital and the research center. As for Lord Jiraiya, well, he is researching for his new book. Hiruzen winced at the mention of what his disciple was doing. Unlike later in the story, the only books Jiraiya was known for was his research in Fuinjutsu. But lately, his weird behavior had taken a turn as Hiruzen caught him sneaking around spring baths in the village. I probably need to check what he is doing. Hiruzen sighed as he vowed to use his crystal ball to check what his mischievous disciple was doing. The sun hung low in the sky, casting a warm glow on the faces of the newly graduated Genin as they gathered once more at the familiar courtyard of the academy. Excitement and nervous energy buzzed as each new Genin was eager to discover their assigned teams and the identity of their Jounin sensei who would guide them. As the moment arrived for the team assignments to be revealed, Renjiro's gaze shifted from face to face in the crowd. He was with both Hiro and Aiko. They were the only ones he was more familiar with. I just hope I get a good sensei. Not much about the current Jounins was told in the anime, so they either died or retired. Renjiro thought, as team after team was announced, each met with a ripple of reactions. Then came the moment for the last team, Team 15, a number that echoed through the courtyard. Only three of us remaining, we must be in the same team, but who is our Jounin sensei? Team 15, the names of Hitaki Hiro, Aiko Nakamura, and Uzumaki Renjiro rang out, and a flicker of understanding passed across Renjiro's face. Thought so, the Jounin assigned is Senju Riku. The name of their Jounin sensei was announced. I can't remember the name from the canon and since he is Senju, he probably died. I really hope he died of old age, otherwise, I am really fucked. While Renjiro was still pondering about his new Genin team, Hiro and Aiko were both excited to be in the same team. It seems that we are now in the same Genin team, yes, it's good we already know each other, so it makes things easier, Hiro replied with a grin evident on his face. Actually, I was dreading the thought of being on another team as that would mean being on a team with two new people, Aiko said while heaving a sigh of relief. Do you guys know anything about our new sensei, Senjuriku? Renjiro asked. He wanted to know more about their new sensei so that he could gauge what type of genin life he should expect under him or her, as he was not completely sure. No, this is the first time I have heard of him, Aiko said while Hiro shook his head. There is no need to waste time worrying. Hopefully, he guides us well. Renjiro surmised. While they were still talking, Renjiro sensed a couple of chakra signatures approaching the academy grounds. From their intensities, he was very sure they were powerful. Immediately Renjiro sensed them, they appeared out of thin air. It was a group of around 20 men and women. Most of them were dressed in traditional blue jumpsuits and green flak jackets. The rest opted for different variations of their clan attire. They wore their different clan attires above chainmail, which Renjiro mistook for fishnets whenever he was cosplaying in his previous life. Was that just their speed or was it body flicker? Renjiro wondered as the speed at which they appeared made him think that they teleported to the vicinity. The new additions approached the different groups that had formed on the grounds after the team announced just minutes ago. They have to be the Jounin senseis. Renjiro concluded as he scanned them with his eyes hoping to find a familiar face. Unfortunately, he did not. One figure was approaching Team 15. Senju Riku stood tall and imposing. Standing at 6 feet 2 inches, his well-built physique spoke of years of rigorous training and battle-hardened experience. His strong shoulders and defined muscles were evident even beneath the standard-issue flak jacket. Riku's eyes, a piercing shade of forest green, held a sense of wisdom and a keen understanding of the world. They scanned his surroundings with a calm intensity. His hair, a dark chestnut brown, was neatly tied in a practical topknot, ensuring it didn't obstruct his vision during combat. Dressed in the standard Jounin attire of Kanoha, Riku wore a dark green flak jacket over a blue long-sleeved shirt. His trousers matched the jacket, and sturdy ninja sandals protected his feet. A utility pouch adorned his waist, carrying the tools and supplies essential for a seasoned ninja. Riku's overall appearance exuded a sense of discipline, experience, and the unyielding spirit of a Kanoha Jounin. You three must be my new students, Riku began, his voice steady and commanding. Tomorrow, we'll have an important meeting to discuss your upcoming missions and training. 
Be at training grounds 51 by 5 a.m. sharp. Don't be late. That early? Hiro asked since that was even before the crack of dawn. He then directed his gaze to Hiro, yes, if it's too early for you you could always opt to go to the Genin Reserve. Hiro shuddered at the thought. The Genin Reserve was a scary place, no one wanted to willingly go there. It was where Shinobi's dreams used to die. At least this was what Hiro knew as his parents used it as a cautionary tale to force him to work harder. In a real sense, it was more or less the same, just without the exaggerated dark end. The Genin Reserve mainly consisted of Genins who did not meet the criteria to be conscripted to Genin teens and Genins who failed to progress and become Chunins. It also had a unique group of individuals that were deemed unworthy by their Jounin senseis to serve under them and thus were sent to the Genin Reserve Corps. Of course, at the moment they were few, due to the volatile nature of the shinobi world where conflict could escalate to fully-fledged world wars, but in the future, their numbers would rise because of one copy ninja's high standards. With that, Riku proceeded to take his leave, but before he did so, oh, I suggest you have a good rest today because tomorrow will be a very long long day. Riku's overemphasis on the word, long, was not unnoticed by the three genins, especially with the sly grin he had on his face while saying it. Did they come here just to relay the information? Couldn't they just have sent the information through the academy? Aiko remarked, seemingly thinking out loud, after seeing that the other Jounins did the same and left in a similar fashion as they arrived. Well, that wasn't ominous at all. But it would be nice to have a Senju Sensei, I am sure they have ways to counter the Sharingan. I am sure Izuna and Kawarama would turn in their graves if they found out the current situation. Renjiro thought as the group bid each other farewells and headed back home. Meditation should be fine for the rest of the day. After tomorrow, I can resume my normal routine. While Rinjiro and the rest of Team 25 were heading back home, Hiruzen was heading to one of the isolated parts of the village. His destination was the secluded quarters housing the village's Jinchuriki. The atmosphere shifted as he traversed through Konoha's more isolated sections. The towering trees cast dappled shadows, creating a natural cocoon around the path to the Jinchuriki's residence. Security measures, intensified in the wake of a kidnapping incident a few years ago by Shinobi from the Hidden Cloud, manifested in vigilant Umbu patrols that seamlessly blended into the surroundings. The masked enforcers kept watch, their presence shrouded in shadows, adding an extra layer of protection to this vital part of the village. The Umbu were stationed at key points and maintained a poised readiness, exemplifying the village's commitment to safeguarding their Jinchuriki. Arriving at the heavily fortified entrance, Hiruzen entered Kushina's dwelling, a space that blended simplicity with warmth. The Jinchuriki, her vibrant red hair framing determined black eyes, sat engrossed in a scroll. Clad in practical ninja attire, she radiated a mix of strength and approachability. A slash N, still find it weird that both Jinchurikis were treated differently with one of them being a former Hokage's son but let me stop my rant. Greetings, Lord Hokage. Kushina said after noticing the Hokage's arrival. I am good, Kushina. I see that you are faring well, Hiruzen replied. Hiruzen then cleared his throat and sat, drawing Kushina's attention away from the scroll. Kushina, I've been considering the idea of you taking on a student. Someone who can learn Fuinjutsu under your guidance. Kushina raised an eyebrow, setting aside the scroll. A student? Why now? We need more skilled Fuinjutsu practitioners, and your expertise is unmatched. I have seen the results with Minato. Hiruzen explained. I believe you could pass on invaluable knowledge. Especially since the candidate is an Uzumaki. Hearing the last statement, Kushina's eyes widened. There were survivors from the fall of Yuzushiogakure, but very few of them opted to relocate to Konoha. Inasmuch as the allied forces also kept Konoha busy hence they could not help Yuzushiogakure with military reinforcements, the survivors still resented Konoha to some degree. Konoha did help, albeit in a limited way, they only provided food and other relief stuff. This was the major reason why the Yuzushiogakure siege took close to five years long. The Naruto timeline is murky, especially to events that occurred before the start of the series. So most of these are tweaks of mind to tailor a comprehensive timeline. What's their name and how did he escape the destruction of the village? Kushina asked. He is Renjiro Uzumaki. The mother was from the Uchiha hence a relative helped him escape. 
Although it was a close call, they did arrive at the village with their lives intact. The Hokage replied. Kushina was very much interested in his Renjiro. The sense of camaraderie between Uzumaki's was very strong. Other than Minato she did not really have someone she could call a friend in the village because Mito had already died that was the downside of becoming a Jinchuriki. Since they were akin to modern day nuclear power, they were regarded as weapons more than they were as people. Alright, but I don't want someone who isn't serious about it. Fuinjutsu demands dedication. As long as he is hardworking then I am fine with it, I'll be sure to let him know, Haruzan assured her. They proceeded to have unnecessary chit chat and after that, Hiruzen left since he still had too much paperwork to go over. The misty morning air hung low over training ground 51 as team 25 assembled at the appointed hour of 5 am. Renjiro arrived promptly, his eyes sharpened with focus. Aiko, with her silver hair glinting in the dim light, soon arrived and took a place next to him, ready for whatever challenge awaited. Hiro arrived last, grumbling to himself about waking up even before dawn. Guess it is safe to say that Hiro is not a morning person, Renjiro remarked. They stood there patiently waiting for their sensei, Senju Riku, to arrive. But soon enough, the mood turned to one of annoyance as it had been more than an hour after the agreed time and Riku had yet to arrive. He's probably caught up with some last-minute preparations, Aiko suggested optimistically, though her eyes betrayed the hint of annoyance in them. Hiro muttered, preparations or not, we're here on time. We could be doing something productive. Finally, three hours later, Riku Senju arrived with an easygoing smile, seemingly unfazed by his lack of punctuality. Ah, good morning, my young shinobi. Sorry for the delay. I hope you guys had a good morning and just arrived, he declared. Good morning sensei, we arrived here at five in the morning as you instructed, Hiro stated. Oh, you did? I only arrived now since you guys complained yesterday, Riku said. Hiro's eyes twitched. Now, to the order of the day, I want everyone to introduce themselves and their dreams. I call bullshit, he clearly knew we'd be there by 5 in the morning Renjiro surmised after seeing Riku disregard his lack of punctuality. Seeing none of the boys speaking up, Aiko decided to take the initiative, my name is Nakamura Aiko. My dream is to become strong enough to protect those dear to me and to ensure that the mistakes of the past. Like Renjiro, Aiko was also a victim of war. She became an orphan due to the previous Shinobi War, second. Her parents were merchants who became collateral damage during the war. Although she lost her parents at a tender age, barely even having a recollection of them, the tough life in the orphanage pushed her to become a Shinobi. She wanted to be strong enough to make the world a better place for others like her. My name is Hitaki Hiro and I want to become strong enough to be the head of my clan. Hiro closely followed. Hiro hailed from a single parent home. His father, a fellow shinobi, died while his mother was still pregnant with him. Hence kids at the academy and in the clan kept making fun of him because of this. This led to an inherent need to prove them wrong and being the clan head was the only way he saw to achieve this. Clan head? Yeah right. Maybe if Kakashi dies before he signs up for the academy. Renjiro remarked. He only saw Hiro's aspiration as a pipe dream after all. My name is Uzumaki Renjiro and I just want to survive. Renjiro boldly declared. His statement caught the rest of the group unaware since it was unconventional. Ah, this must be the kid that the Hokage talked about. I guess witnessing his whole life falling apart with the fall of Yuzushio traumatized him. Riku concluded upon hearing Renjiro's statement. Renjiro was telling the truth. Knowing what was to come in this world he had to try his best to survive. The threat of the Third Shinobi War, Nine Tails Rampage and even the Uchiha clan massacre always gloomily hanged on him. He might not be a part of the clan, but the fact that he has a Sharingan puts him in danger by association. Renjiro just wanted to be strong enough to retire, maybe open up a shop, and live peacefully. Was that too much to ask? Great. Good to see young Shinobi having great aspirations, Riku said with his gaze briefly falling on Renjiro. But, Riku said ominously, you first have to prove that you are worthy enough to work under me. So I am going to give you guys a test. I thought I was done with tests after I graduated from the academy. Hiro thought. Aiko was visibly surprised as she kept exchanging glances with Renjiro and Hiro. 
Rinjiro had expected this even though it was widely speculated that the test Kakashi gave his team was only because it was some sort of tradition to a group of shinobi. Please be the bell test, please be the bell test, please be the bell test. Rinjiro hoped it would be the bell test as that would make his work easier as he would only have to convince the other two to work as a team. Riku took a scroll from his pocket and unfurled it. He then went on to retrieve three similar rocks from it. Upon closer examination, Renjiro found out that they were made from the same material as the small object Sato had given him during his sensor training. A storage scroll. I wonder how they work. And also do those stones work the same as the one Sato gave me? Holding up the three stones, Riku declared, Your mission is simple, survive for 24 hours in this training ground while protecting these stones. If you fail, it's back to the academy for you. Renjiro, Aiko, and Hiro exchanged glances, uncertainty flickering in their eyes. The challenge seemed straightforward, but the devil was in the details. Now, here's the twist, Riku continued a glint of mischief in his eyes. I'll be coming after your stones periodically, but to make it interesting, I'll limit myself to using only Academy Jutsus. Consider it a handicap for me, and an opportunity for you to showcase your skills. I knew it. It could not be that easy. And that's a stupid handicap, he's a jounin so we would never be able to win against him. This is child abuse. Renjiro ranted after hearing the premise of the test. The team processed the information, realizing that they not only had to survive in the wilderness but also defend their stones against their jounin sensei's attacks. With that, Riku gave the stones to the three, each member of team 15 assigned to protect one. With that, Riku vanished in a blur, leaving Team 15 exchanging glances once more. The trio found themselves debating the most effective strategy to protect their stones. Renjiro spoke first. We should stick together as a team. Our strength lies in numbers, and facing Riku individually might not be as effective as combining our skills. Hiro, considering the possibilities, shook her head. I disagree. If we split up, we can cover more ground and anticipate Riku's attacks from different angles. It's about maximizing our chances of success. Aiko chimed in, agreed. Renjiro, facing Riku head-on might play into his strengths. We need to survive, teaming up together will only make it easier for Riku-sensei to get all the stones in one swoop. Renjiro frowned, he recognized the importance of adaptability but was still hesitant to abandon the concept of teamwork. We can cover more ground as a team, and my Sharingan can detect Riku's movements. Defending as one unit would be easier. Aiko placed a hand on Renjiro's shoulder, Renjiro, we're not dismissing the importance of teamwork. But in this situation, splitting up gives us a tactical advantage. Hiro added, our goal is to protect the stones and pass the test. Let's use our strength strategically. We still haven't had a lot of experience fighting as a team, so it may be counterproductive. Have they forgotten the fact that he can use clones? Splitting up would just make it easier for him to pick us apart one by one. Rinjiro sighed, realizing trying to change their minds would be a lost cause. Fine, let's give it a try. Satisfied with the plan, they both dispersed in three different directions hoping that they would pass Riku's test. I'm the best sensor out of all of us. I want to see how they think they'll survive this. I just hope I was right with teamwork being the objective. As Team 25 engaged in their heated debate over the optimal strategy, Riku Senju, at a considerable distance away, found a secluded spot on the training ground to enact his next move. Riku's chakra surged, and with precise hand signs, he channeled his chakra. With a final, powerful slam of his hands into the ground, a shockwave reverberated through the ground, and a colossal cloud of smoke erupted. The smoke billowed and swirled taking on a myriad of shapes before settling into a form. As the mist began to clear, a silhouette appeared. The smoke billowed and swirled, taking on a myriad of shapes before settling into a form. As the mist began to clear, silhouettes appeared. As the misty training ground slowly unveiled the scene, a pack of wolves materialized from the dissipating smoke summoned by Riku's Jutsu. The ethereal mist clung to the majestic creatures, emphasizing their otherworldly presence. The wolves stood in a formation, their fur a mix of shades blending seamlessly with the mist. Their eyes, gleaming with intelligence and an instinctual ferocity, surveyed the surroundings as if they were attuned to the very essence of the misty wilderness. 
The alpha wolf, slightly larger than the others, bore markings that seemed to shimmer in the diffused light. Its eyes locked onto Riku, a silent acknowledgement of their shared purpose. The rest of the pack, arranged in a disciplined manner, awaited the command from their summoner. Okami, Riku began, I need your pack to help me out with something. What is it Riku? Okami, the alpha wolf asked. I got new genins, so it is the usual test. Just test them a little bit. For how long? Half a day. But give them breaks in between. Okami, with a dignified nod, acknowledged Riku's command. He released a low, almost imperceptible, growl to his pack who were eager for the challenge. Riku observed the wolves with a sense of satisfaction. He had summoned not just a challenge for Team 15 but an ally that would help him test their teamwork, strategy, and adaptability. As the pack of wolves left, Riku wondered, what to do next? I'll leave Okama and his pack to have some fun. Riku decided to leave the training ground temporarily. As he disappeared, he contemplated the unfolding scenario. It was going to be a long day for his genins. The first six hours in training ground 51 were a relentless gauntlet for the team. The forested landscape had transformed into a battleground where the summoned pack of wolves orchestrated a relentless series of assaults. Each of the three genins found themselves constantly on the move, defending their stones against the cunning predators. What are they? As far as I know, they shouldn't be animals in Kanoha's training grounds, let alone wolves. Rinjiro thought as he had three wolves hot on his tail. The only possible explanation is there might be from the Inazuka clan that Riku commissioned for their torture, or they might be Riku's summons. Knowing the Inazuka clan, the latter is probably the case. Rinjiro stopped and turned to face the wolves chasing them, he made the tiger hand sign and performed the great fireball jutsu. Immediately he released the flaming ball, Renjiro followed it up with the rat sign and the air around the fireball began to burst amplifying the exploding aftermath. I need to distract them again. Renjiro made five clones from the clone jutsu. The clones all scattered in different directions. This was what Renjiro had been doing the last couple of hours. When they first decided to split up, Renjiro diminished his chakra signature, hoping that Riku would not find him. Unfortunately for him, the wolves who had started attacking found him with the help of their keen sense of smell. They immediately began attacking Renjiro. Renjiro utilized his Sharingan to its fullest extent in a bid to form some sort of resistance against the attacks. His every step was calculated, and his eyes darted between the shadows, anticipating the next attack. His kunai and shuriken flew with precision, keeping the wolves at bay. After some time, Renjiro realized that what he was doing was pointless as the wolves were able to form clones. He could not identify what type of clones they were since he had only been exposed to the normal clone jutsu. Since fighting was futile, he opted to escape the chase. He would run then when he sensed them approaching, he would use a jutsu and clones to distract them. It was taking a toll on his chakra reserves because they always found him, so he was always using chakra either through the jutsus or by reinforcing his physical capabilities. I wonder how many teams passed this torturous test. Elsewhere, Hiro and Aiko were facing the same fate. However, Hiro had the short end of the stick as Aiko used her jinjutsu skills to escape the wolves pursuit. I should have listened to Renjiro's plan, Hiro rude. As the wolves relentlessly pressed their attacks, Hiro began to regret the decision to split up. His movements became defensive, trying to fend off the agile predators without leaving himself vulnerable. After around eight hours of relentless battles with the summoned pack of wolves, Riku Senju, with a cunning smile, decided it was time to return to the training ground. The forested training ground, now marked by signs of the intense skirmishes, awaited the next phase of the challenge. As Riku reappeared, he casually unsummoned Okami and his pack, dissolving the presence of the formidable wolves. The absence of the relentless attackers gave the genins a momentary sense of relief. Riku stretched and then, with a hint of determination in his eyes, he declared, time to get serious. Riku initiated the next phase of his assessment, he wanted to engage each member of the team individually. He made three shadow clones. The shadow clones transformed and took the appearance of the three genins. Let's see how good they are. Ah. Renjiro heaved as he finally had a moment of respite as the wolves chasing him disappeared. It seems that Riku cancelled the summons. Although it's great for me, he must be planning something. 
Rinjiro sat in the lotus position and activated his chakra field before he began his meditation. He had to regain as much chakra as he could before Riku put his plans into place. After a while, Renjiro's instinct screamed at him and he twisted his body. Right as he did, a kunai grazed his arm. Looking at the direction it came from, lo and behold he saw himself. Who are you? You conscious. It's definitely Riku. Renjiro thought as he dodged more kunais heading his way. After the kunais, the clone to the initiative and attacked Renjiro by launching a kick towards his abdomen. Renjiro evaded it and returned one to the clone. Hmm. It's probably a shadow clone. It probably has more chakra than I do. With that, Renjiro activated his Sharingan and the fight ensued with an exchange of attacks. What's the point of all this? Soon enough, the exchange started becoming annoying for Renjiro. When he activated his Sharingan, he had expected a tough fight since Riku was a Jounin. Instead, he got the most annoying thing. The clone matched all his attacks. It was funny how he was the one with the Sharingan, but it was his movements being read. Even when he resorted to ninjutsu, the clone he was fighting replicated the same jutsus towards him. I knew pushing off learning the Sharingan Jinjutsu would come to bite me in the ass. Although he is a senju, at least that would be something that the clone wouldn't copy. The only silver lining to this was that his teammates were experiencing the same misfortune. Hiro was also annoyed at how his clone was copying both his taijutsu and bukijutsu skills while Aiko had the worst of it since the jinjutsu she was experiencing was more potent than the one she used. Riku wanted to test the various fields that the genins had prospered in. He also wanted to know how they would react to pressure which was an important metric for their performance on the field. What annoyed Renjiro and the rest of Team 15, besides the fact that Riku was perfectly fighting them using their preconceived strengths, was that he was doing all this looking like them. He had used the transformation jutsu to turn to whoever he was fighting against. It was basically like fighting yourself. Which was really frustrating, to the genins that is, Riku was enjoying getting on their nerves. After what seemed like an eternity, Riku concluded his little data collection exercise. With a satisfied nod, he resummoned Okami and his pack back, releasing Team 15 from the relentless one-on-one -on -one engagements to a more constant one. The wolves, appearing once again on the battlefield, added an additional layer of complexity to the test's final phase. Rinjiro decided it was time to change the tide of the battle. Activating his chakra field, he quickly tracked down his teammates, who were scattered throughout the forested training ground. After locating them, Renjiro conveyed his plan, this is getting us nowhere. We need to work together to fend off these wolves. We've been through enough, and it is getting dark. After what they had been through the last 15 hours, plus the fact that it was getting dark, Aiko and Hiro didn't have any other option as their chakra reserves were dwindling. Without any solder pills or time to meditate, the situation was only bound to get worse. The trio, now working as a cohesive unit, faced the wolves with synchronized movements and coordinated attacks. It was amazing what being at the end of your ropes could do to someone. As the team, now working seamlessly together, faced the wolves in a united front, Riku Senju appeared with a satisfied smile. With a wave of his hand, Riku called off the summoned wolves, dispelling them into the training ground. You've done well, Team 15, Riku commended, his eyes reflecting pride in the young shinobi. You've passed the test. You've done well, Team 15, Riku commended, you've passed the test. As Riku announced the successful completion of the test, a wave of relief and joy washed over the three genins. The expressions on Renjiro, Aiko, and Hiro's faces transformed from weariness to pure elation. This is where I should have my big, I told you so moment with these two, but I'm sure they are worn out from the test maybe next time. They are still kids, after all. Renjiro thought while smiling wryly. It had been a long couple of hours for the trio without enough food and rest. Although there was the option of using soldier pills, Riku prohibited them from doing so. He stated that using them would create a dependency on them. Plus, if they could not last long in this test, then they still have a long way to go in their shinobi careers. While the trio were still relishing their newfound rest, Riku's expression shifted, and he adopted a more serious demeanor. He gestured for them to gather around as he began to provide feedback, highlighting areas where each genin could improve based on their performance. Renjiro, Riku started, looking at the young Uzumaki with a discerning gaze. 
while your Sharingan proved valuable, there were instances where you relied too heavily on it. Overdependence can be a weakness. It's crucial to balance your innate abilities with strategic thinking to maximize your effectiveness. Turning his attention to Aiko, Riku continued, Aiko, your Jinjutsu skills are commendable, but there were moments when you hesitated to transition into Taijutsu when needed. I know that you excel in Jinjutsu but ignoring Taijutsu and Ninjutsu will not be beneficial for you. You should start working on them to bring them to a decent level. Finally, addressing Hiro, Riku remarked, Hiro, your Taijutsu prowess is evident, but there were instances where you could have utilized Ninjutsu. Your situation is similar to Aiko's. Mix up your techniques to keep your opponents off guard. The Genins listened attentively, absorbing Riku's constructive criticism. Each piece of feedback was delivered with the intention of helping them grow and refine their skills. In the heat of battle, it's easy to fall back on familiar strategies, Riku continued, his tone firm but encouraging. But true growth comes from pushing beyond your comfort zone, adapting to unforeseen challenges, and learning from every experience. Remember, the goal was not just to succeed in the test but to continuously improve. Take these lessons to heart, and let them guide you in the future. Alright, go home, and get some rest. We will meet the day after tomorrow here same time. After concluding, Riku flickered away. Finally. Some time to rest. Wait, does same time mean 5 in the morning, or does it mean the same time he arrived? Renjiro wondered if the ambiguity in Riku's words was intentional or not. Following Riku's exit, the others were equally, if not more, tired and they all went back to their homes. The journey back home felt like a series of deliberate challenges as fatigue weighed on them. Upon reaching his home, Renjiro entered with a sense of relief. The familiar surroundings offered solace, and without much ceremony, he headed straight to his room. In his room, Renjiro, still in his ninja attire, collapsed onto his bed. The softness of the mattress felt like a luxury after the trials of the day. He closed his eyes, the exhaustion settling into his bones. As the soft light of evening filtered through the curtains, Renjiro was stirred from his deep slumber by a gentle knock on his bedroom door. A clan messenger stood at the threshold, bearing news that jolted him awake. Renjiro, the messenger, who outwardly wore the Uchiha clan symbol, spoke respectfully, there's a clan meeting scheduled for tomorrow. Your presence is required. Renjiro, still groggy from the unexpected nap, blinked in surprise at the messenger. He had lost track of time in the embrace of sleep, and the realization that the day had slipped away caught him off guard. Clan meeting? I'm not even a part of the clan. Let me just go since I'm getting all these benefits, it's the least I could do. Renjiro nodded in acknowledgement, expressing his understanding. Thank you for letting me know, Renjiro replied, his mind quickly adjusting to the upcoming responsibilities. I'll be there. A clan meeting huh? The only ones I remember were those where the Uchiha plotted the coup. It should still be interesting. Shrugging off any lingering drowsiness, Renjiro decided to engage in some light workout for warm-up. With determination in his eyes, Renjiro readied himself for a session of intense body workout. The following day, as the first light of dawn painted the sky, Renjiro found himself in the quiet pre-dawn hours, having spent the night in deep meditation after his rigorous workout. The stillness of the night had offered him a chance to reflect on his actions and how he could improve them. Soon, the familiar knock on his door echoed through his residence. Tekka, stood outside, ready to accompany Renjiro to the Uchiha clan headquarters. Good morning Renjiro, Tekka greeted. Good morning Tekka. Are you planning on going to the clan meeting? Do I have a choice? Renjiro thought. Yes, I was just finishing up on my morning routine. Weren't you going to go with Inabi and Yashiro? I was, but then when we reached the hall, we thought it would be good if someone came to accompany you. Tekka smiled. Is this out of courtesy, or is it genuine? Renjiro wondered. After Renjiro finished his preparations, they set out towards the heart of the Uchiha district. On their way, they exchanged their experiences with their new Genin teams. An obstacle race for a test? Why did we get the short end of the stick with our sensei? The guy practically forced us through hell. Renjiro lamented the moment he learned of Tekka's experience. As they approached the meeting place, the grandeur of the structure came into view. The meeting hall was an imposing building of polished stone. It stood tall against the backdrop of the morning sky. 
Upon entering the hall, Renjiro was met by the clan symbol grandly displayed. The air, scented with a hint of incense, added to the solemn ambience of the space. Well, there is a reason they are regarded as one of the top clans not only in Konoha but in all elemental nations. Rinjiro noted after seeing the clan in all its glory. As more Uchiha clan members gathered in the meeting room, Daichi, the venerable clan head, took his place at the head of the circular table, commanding attention. Daichi's eyes, weathered by years of experience and responsibility, swept across the room. His gaze then settled on Renjiro and the other three boys who had recently undergone the Genin promotion exams. A subtle nod of approval and pride accompanied his gaze. Renjiro, Inabi, Tekka, and Yashiro, Daichi began, addressing the Genin with a measured tone. Your performance in the promotion exam has not gone unnoticed. You finally become Genins and are now qualified to bear the struggles and legacy of our clan. A murmur of approval rippled through the clan members present, a collective recognition of the Genin's achievements. Daichi continued, you should work hard to become Chunins as early as possible. The village is in need, and the police force needs more numbers to help with the lawkeeping. Ah shit, I remember Miwa mentioning something like this. Daichi shed light on the pivotal role of the police force during the clan meeting for the new additions. He emphasized that beyond the prowess displayed in battle, Every Uchiha shinobi was mandated to serve in the police force upon becoming Chunins. Of course, this only applied to those who awakened the Sharingan since they needed more time to hone their dojitsu. For the rest, they were to join after a minimum amount of time as Genins. They still needed fodder after all. The police force played a crucial role in maintaining order, investigating crimes, and safeguarding the village. This mandatory service represented the Uchiha commitment to the village's well-being, instilling in each shinobi the duty to contribute their skills for the greater good. After Daichi finished, the other Uchiha clan members congratulated Renjiro and the rest for their achievements. The meeting seamlessly transitioned to other matters, such as the patrol schedule and clan resource distribution. As the morning sun illuminated the training ground, Riku unleashed his training regimen upon Renjiro, Aiko, and hero with a zeal that could only be described as demonic. His approach to physical conditioning was as relentless as a demon's pursuit, pushing the boundaries of the three genin's endurance with a merciless fervor. The workout was a symphony of sweat and strained muscles, orchestrated by Riku's seemingly boundless energy. I had expected to go to hell after dying then I was happy I came to this new world but it seems the devil sent Riku to come collect his dues. Renjiro, accustomed to challenges, found himself in uncharted territory, realizing that Riku's definition of intensity surpassed anything he had ever encountered. The training made the team miss the good times when Riku was late for their early morning meetup. Just like most good times, which was only one instance in this case, it was short-lived. In the midst of the grueling routine, Riku's laughter echoed like a mischievous imp reveling in the chaos it had unleashed. Each drop of sweat seemed to be a tribute to the training demon, and the Genins couldn't help but lament as they navigated through a sea of physical demands. I want to die. That was Renjiro's last thought as he collapsed in training ground 51. Right beside him were Hiro and Aiko, both in similar states. He supposedly lasted longer than the two in the first segment of their training, but that was nothing to brag about, as lasting longer only meant more pain. That's for today's workout. Take an hour's break, then we will move to the next segment. Riku declared, seemingly ignoring the fact that none of his students were in a state to listen to him. The usual day for Team 15 began with a brutal awakening as Riku expected them to rise at the crack of dawn, commencing an intense body workout that spanned from 5 a.m. to 8 a.m., a complete three hours. Following this early morning crucible, a brief respite arrived as Riku allowed them to take a break until 9 a.m. However, as the clock struck 10 a.m., the next phase commenced. From 10 a.m. to 2 p.m., the Genins would find themselves entangled in Taijutsu battles against the seasoned master himself, Riku. Despite their concerted efforts, the matches unfolded with a predictable rhythm as Riku, an expert Taijutsu specialist, dominated every encounter. The score stood at an overwhelming 18-0, all victories leaning in Riku's favor. Undeterred by the defeats, Riku forced them to engage in at least three battles every day. Today, the trio, fueled by the determination to break the 18-0 streak, moved with a newfound intensity. 
It was weird that the hour-long break Riku gave them did wonders, and they actually recovered most of their strength. Must be Chakra. Renjiro noted. Despite being in this world for close to three years, the capabilities of Chakra never stopped to amaze Renjiro. It was like a gift that keeps on giving. But that was for later now, Renjiro needed to focus on their spar with Riku. Renjiro darted with speed, launching calculated strikes. Aiko also launched her own kicks and punches. Hiro, the agile force, aimed to disrupt with unpredictable maneuvers. Yet, Riku moved like a blur, effortlessly countering every strike. His movements were fluid and precise, a nod to years of experience he had accumulated. The battle unfolded in a mesmerizing dance, each clash resonating with the clash of steel and flesh. Despite their concerted efforts, the Genins found themselves constantly outmaneuvered. Yes, faster. Riku's voice echoed through the training ground, a mix of amusement and encouragement. As the battle reached its conclusion, Riku, with a satisfied nod, acknowledged the progress they had made. The 17-0 streak had changed. It was now 18-0. Good job guys, Riku said with a mocking smile on his face. Although Riku continued to accumulate the wins, it was not as easy as before for him to win. The team was clearly making visible progress when it came to Taijutsu. A win is a win. Renjiro surmised. It was impossible to better a Jounin with their current strength. They could only do so if the Jounin was largely holding back, but Riku was not that type of person. He knew if he did so, his students might become conceited. So he preferred to show them how far they still need to go to become decent shinobis. So lasting longer than before against Riku was more than enough to depict their progress. I think it is time to include ninjutsu in your training, Riku said with a thoughtful look on his face before he continued, since it would actively reduce the time we spend on the current segments, I guess I will have to just increase the intensity of all the segments. Increase the intensity? There's even more to this? I might have actually chosen the wrong career here. His last statement killed the all signs of life that were coming back to his students' eyes as they thought they were getting some sort of relief. Depleting chakra reserves was worth it to them if they could be able to avoid any physical contact with Riku. Renjiro, having endured the grueling training regimen under Riku's relentless guidance, returned home with a body that bore the echoes of exertion. Aware that meditation was not only a personal practice but a vital means of restoring his depleted chakra reserves, Renjiro sought solace in the quiet of his room. With closed eyes, he assumed a meditative posture. Drawing upon the chakra within, Renjiro entered a meditative trance. His energy flow, disrupted and intensified during the day's training, now found equilibrium. Each breath became a rhythmic dance, harmonizing with the pulse of his chakra network. I need to buy weights, even with Riku's demanding training, my body has only seen minuscule improvements. I should have enough money to get them, so I do not need to disturb Miwa with this. Renjiro emerged from his meditation with a new sense of refreshment. He prepared to go to the town in search of training weights. These specialized weights, intricately inscribed with few Fuenjutsu, were used by shinobi seeking to enhance their physical strength and speed through intensive training. Renjiro made his way through the familiar streets of the village. In the town's market area, with its array of shops and vendors, Renjiro sought out merchants known for dealing in unique shinobi equipment who might offer such specialized tools. Entering a shop adorned with various ninja tools, Renjiro inquired, Hello, do you have training weights? Ooh, what a nice and respectable boy. The shopkeeper, a middle-aged woman, thought before replying, Yes we do. What type do you want? What types are there? We have three types of training weights. The first two are of the chainmail variant. The first type is designed for the limbs. They are worn on specific limbs with the singular purpose of accelerating and refining the shinobi's movements. The second type of weights is the full body armor type. It covers the whole body, especially the torso and legs. This weight allows the user to exert control over the additional burden by manipulating the weight distribution through chakra infusion. The last type, which is the most expensive out of the three, comes in the unique form of a seal. It is a seal matrix inscribed on chakra-infused paper. This compact yet formidable weight adheres directly to the user's skin. But I can't sell this to you. Why? Rinjiro was perplexed, because why would she tell him about it if she couldn't sell it to him? This made him just want to buy it more. 
The seal requires a fully matured body and since you are a chi dash, I mean a young shinobi, you'll be at risk of stagnating your natural body growth if you use it. That makes sense. Although some risks pay off, I don't want to take this one. Okay. The first type is most likely what Rock Lee was wearing while I have no problem with it, the second type would be better since it covers more areas of the body than just the limbs. Renjiro thought. Then I will take the second type of training weight. How much is it? When Renjiro got back home, he decided to try on the weights he had purchased. Carefully donning the chainmail weights, he felt the intricate links settling around his arms, legs, and torso. The added weight was subtle but perceptible. The storekeeper just said to infuse my chakra to it and I can manipulate the weight. The maximum weight should be around 800 kilograms, approximately 1,100 pounds, dot. Of course, there were heavier options, but Renjiro decided to start with one of the lighter versions first. If he ever outgrew this, then he would purchase the other heavier versions. With a focused determination, he infused his chakra into the chainmail weights that covered his entire body. As his chakra intermingled with the intricate links, the weight began to shift. Renjiro could feel the added burden increasing. This should be bearable. It should be barely an eighth of the maximum weight. It is still crazy how I can manage to wear a hundred kilograms, 220 pounds, of weight without any issues. Back on earth, I could not even bench press this much. Emboldened by the initial success of infusing chakra into the sealed weights, Renjiro's confidence swelled, and a tinge of conceit crept into his approach. In a rash decision, he pushed the boundaries further, infusing more and more chakra until he reached the maximum weight the chainmail could bear. A moment of triumph quickly turned into a sobering reality. As the weights reached their peak, the sudden surge of additional weight felt as though a mountain had descended upon Renjiro. The young shinobi now found himself buckling under the overwhelming force. Shit. I shouldn't have gone to the maximum weight instantly. Even cars need some seconds to go from zero to a hundred. Struggling against the newfound burden, Renjiro's body immediately fell to the ground in an uncomfortable posture. The chainmail, now felt like an anchor, threatening to drag him down. Realizing the imprudence of his actions, Renjiro swiftly halted the influx of chakra into the chainmail weights. With a controlled exhale, he felt the immediate release of the overwhelming pressure that had burdened him just moments ago. That's better. Breathing a sigh of relief, he stood there, humbled by the weight of his own overconfidence which was quite ironic. The chainmail, now devoid of the excessive chakra, reverted to its initial state, still a challenge, but one that Renjiro could manage and grow with. Still, while watching the anime, especially that Chunin preliminary between Gara and Rock Lee and he revealed his weights, I always thought that the kanji was some sort of fuinjutsu. But I was wrong since these weights do not even use fuinjutsu. Well apart from the third type which has a seal as its only component. From what I gathered, they are made from some sort of metal alloy which helps in absorbing chakra to increase its weight. That means that to sustain them, I need to infuse my chakra periodically into them. Isn't this a bit tiresome? There should be an effective way to streamline this. But how does it work since fuinjutsu is mainly sealing? If it seals the chakra, how do you lighten the weights? You can't destroy the chakra as chakra is energy, and energy cannot be destroyed. Or am I missing something here? Maybe there is a way to make better weights using fuinjutsu. But it might not be present or only specialized clans have them. I know the Uchiha do not have them since they barely have any fuinjutsu grandmasters. Even the storekeeper gets his stock from out of the village. Although Haruzen promised someone to guide me in fuinjutsu, it won't hurt to start reading ahead. Reaching that conclusion, Renjiro made his way to the library to research fuinjutsu. He decided to go to the public library as opposed to the clan one because when he first arrived at the clan library, he had checked on the various types of knowledge the library had. Despite the long history of the clan as well as their dojitsu, they had limited knowledge about fuinjutsu. With him now a fully-fledged genin, he had access to more information in the library. He could now access a wider array of jutsus he previously couldn't. They were not a lot as genins were still considered fodders in the grand schemes of the shinobi world. Finding books about fuinjutsu, Renjiro took a seat and started reading. It was in the evening, so the library was not that crowded. Um, is this book actually written by Jiraiya? 
I could have guessed that he was an expert in Fuinjutsu, but never would I think that he could write books like this. Starting from the beginning, Renjiro learned that Fuinjutsu unfolded through the symbiotic relationship between symbols, patterns, and intention. At its essence, Fuinjutsu represented the fusion of spiritual and physical energies, encapsulated in seals that range from the simple to the more complex ones. The foundation of Fuinjutsu lied in the manipulation of chakra. Seals, the fundamental building blocks of this art, acted as conduits for channeling and containing chakra. Whether inscribed on surfaces, woven into fabrics, or embedded within tools, these seals become vessels for the practitioner's intent. Central to Fuinjutsu was the concept of containment and release. Seals served as gates, allowing the controlled flow of chakra to achieve the intended purposes. The creation of a seal demanded precision and a deep understanding of the intended outcome. Practitioners mastered the art of inscribing symbols with flawless execution, each mark carrying the weight of the intended purpose. The complexity of Fuinjutsu extended to the myriad types of seals, each tailored for distinct applications. Storage seals, for instance, permitted the containment of objects O in limited alternate dimensions, accessible only to those with the knowledge of the specific seal matrix. Barrier seals erected metaphysical walls, made of chakra, to shield spaces or individuals from external forces. Furthermore, Fuinjutsu involved the delicate balance of yin and yang chakra. Activating a seal required the channeling of the user's chakra into the designated symbol or matrix. The seal would resonate with the practitioner's intent and respond by initiating the predetermined effect. Mastery of this process demanded not only an acute understanding of chakra control but also an intuitive grasp of the seal matrix embedded in each seal. Learning it involves two steps. The first step is writing the required seal matrix. It involves using the correct symbols and the logic. The last step is infusing chakra into the seal matrix for it to perform its intended purpose. This kinda reminds me of basic programming where the symbols are the programming language, the logic still remains the same and chakra infusion is the code compilation. That makes it easier to understand. Just as a coder infuses lines of code with a specific purpose, Fuinjutsu also embeds specific intent into each seal. Whether it's storing an object, creating a barrier, or manipulating energy, the focus on intent is a common similarity. Moreover, dash, excuse me, the library is closing, a mildly brisk voice broke Renjiro out of his reverie. It was then that Renjiro realized a young male shinobi talking. He looked around and noticed that he was the only one left in the library. The realization that he had lost track of time dawned upon Renjiro as he noticed the darkness beyond the library's windows. It was time to leave. He gathered himself and made his way through the now dimly lit library. Upon stepping outside, Renjiro was greeted by the cool night air and the soft glow of street lamps lining the path home. The following day, as promised, Riku decided to introduce ninjutsu to their training. First of all, I hope every one of you knows their chakra affinities, Riku started. Everyone apart from Aiko nodded their heads. Renjiro and Hiro knew about their affinities long before they joined the academy. Sensei, I do not know my chakra affinity, Aiko muttered. That's fine Riku, if that's the case, then everyone will use these chakra papers I came with. Riku handed each of them chakra papers and the genins began infusing their chakra into it. For Hiro, his chakra paper began to solidify. It showed signs of dirt which eventually crumbled up. Aiko's paper was the flashiest of them all, besides Renjiro's of course. It lit up and turned into ash. So fire, earth and dual one of fire and wind. That is interesting. At least now we know that the Uzumaki boy will at least attain the Jounin rank. Renjiro thought that his dual affinities would draw too much attention but was glad when Riku revealed his affinities. He had dual affinities like Renjiro which were water and earth. That reminds me, Guy also had dual chakra nature affinities, so it shouldn't be that unique. This did not mean that Riku would not be able to guide Aiko and Renjiro in ninjutsu as affinities only made learning jutsus of said element easier. It was not impossible for one to learn jutsus of other elements, case in point, the fourth Hokage who mastered all chakra natures. Besides, one of the requirements of becoming a Jounin in Kanoha was mastering two chakra natures. Riku went with fire and earth. 
He had not mastered the lightning and wind natures as it requires abysmal effort for him to even learn any jutsu above the A rank of both chakra natures. The first jutsu that we will begin with is the body flicker technique. It's a technique that allows a ninja to move at an incredible speed, almost becoming a blur to the naked eye. Riku said before continuing, mastering this jutsu will enhance your mobility and tactical advantage in the field. It is one of the few jutsus that will be easily integrated into your overall fighting style. Riku proceeded to demonstrate the technique, seamlessly disappearing from one spot and reappearing a short distance away. The fluidity of his movements was both impressive and mystifying, leaving an indelible image of speed and precision in the minds of the young genin. It looks like teleporting but he is actually leaving an afterimage by moving at an almost untraceable speed. This will be an important jutsu to learn. Renjiro pondered. Now, pay attention, Riku instructed as he walked them through the foundational principles of the body flicker jutsu. He explained the necessity of precise chakra control and the synchronization of mind and body to execute the jutsu seamlessly. The only good thing about this technique, other than its utility, is that its requirements are very forthcoming. It only required the tiger seal to perform. Renjiro thought after getting a breakdown of the jutsu from the scrolls, as well as the demonstration, Riku showed them. It also betrays its D rank, which mainly consists of jutsus easier to learn as compared to high ranks, as it is very hard to master the jutsu. The biggest issue is getting used to traveling at insanely high speeds. It also says that having some kind of distraction like smoke, leaves or even jinjutsu would help enhance the jutsu. The distraction would make it less hard to see which direction the user went. After Riku's demonstration, the three tried performing the jutsu for the first time. However, the initial attempts proved to be far from graceful. Instead of becoming elusive blurs, the genins found themselves stumbling, tripping over their own feet. It has a steep learning curve but they should get it soon. As long as they can flicker to about 200 meters, they would have achieved a decent mastery over the jutsu. Riku mused after watching the disastrous initial attempts by his students. Renjiro had already tried using his Sharingan to copy jutsus before, but he soon found out that the copying ability of the Sharingan was not as straightforward as it seemed. Once the Sharingan saw a jutsu, it instantly memorized how it was performed, from the hand signs to how the chakra was used. However, memorization did not equate to replication. It was like a medical student memorizing all the books and videos on surgery and then being asked to perform the procedure. There was a 100% chance that they won't get everything correct or do it even nearly perfectly. The Sharingan was basically a tutorial on how to perform the jutsu, otherwise, the Uchiha would be spamming a thousand jutsus as long as they meet the chakra requirement. Despite failing initially, the genin still persisted. With each attempt, they inched closer to the mastery that seemed elusive in those early moments. Fortunately, after several rounds of practice, with Riku closely monitoring their progress, the genins began to grasp the fundamentals of the body flicker jutsu. I've finally gotten a hang of it. Renjiro remarked as he flickered 50 meters ahead of him. He had gotten better at performing the jutsu. The only issue was that the distance he could flicker to was limited. The largest he had flickered to was 53 meters. Aiko and Hiro were also in the same boat as the largest distance they had flickered to was 60 and 48 meters respectively. As the sun climbed higher in the sky, Riku observed the results of their efforts. Good work guys, he commended a glint of approval in his eyes. You still have to work on the jutsu. I observed that without full concentration, it would be hard for you guys to use during stressful situations. You have to master it to the point where you could do it in your sleep. I should probably use shadow clones to improve this jutsu. That will save so much needed time. That's right, Renjiro had already learned shadow clone jutsu. It was imperative to learn it as it would improve the potency of his training and also cut down his training time. With the clone jutsu as a foundation, it was easier to learn the jutsu. He could also make the same number of shadow clones as he could with the clone jutsu. This greatly increased the effectiveness of his training sessions. After the ninjutsu training, the genins were expecting to be released but Riku disappointed them, yet again. Since we have taken too much time on the body flicker jutsu, we should just have our usual spars and then call it a day, normally this would send shivers down the genin spines but the three shinobis did not even show it on their faces as they were already numb from the pain. 
both physical and psychological ones Riku inflicted on them. The result of the spars only added three more victories to Riku. With the lesson concluded, the team dispersed to continue with their own personal training. Renjiro planned to continue with his Fuinjutsu training. As Renjiro was delving into Fuinjutsu from the books he had borrowed from the library the previous day, he grappled with the realization that there was a difference between understanding the concepts and the practical application of Fuinjutsu. There were concepts that he had not considered like calligraphy and symbol memorization. Renjiro also came across Jutsushiki, which was a chakra language, that served as the foundation for Fuinjutsu and Ninjutsu in general. It formed the various formulae for Ninjutsu. With it, the Fuinjutsu symbols were formed. After understanding what he needed to do, Renjiro started memorizing the symbols first. With his Sharingan, this process was greatly expedited. With a furrowed brow, he then moved to calligraphy, carefully etching symbols onto parchment in an attempt to replicate the complex arrangements found in the scrolls. The silence of his study was punctuated only by the scratch of the quill against parchment and the occasional turn of a scroll. Of course, since Renjiro was just practicing, there was no need to purchase the recommended chakra ink and paper for this. That step would follow when he was ready to practice his first seal matrix. With hours of meticulous practice behind him, Renjiro felt a sense of readiness that signaled the next step in his Fuinjutsu journey. He was now ready to begin practicing on seals. Eager to put his refined skills to the test, Renjiro decided it was time to venture into the realm of seal matrices and seals. Immediately after training the following day, Renjiro purchased the chakra ink and paper required to make seals. I really need to find a source of income, Renjiro muttered as he headed back home. Despite the strain on his finances, Renjiro considered it a worthy investment. Oh well, once I become good in Fuinjutsu, then I can start selling my own seals. The two objects purchased were very fundamental for making seals. The chakra ink, a blend of pigments infused with chakra, was used to enhance the potency and longevity of the seals. The parchment, carefully selected for its quality, would cradle the symbols with a conducive surface for seal imprinting. Back from his errands, Renjiro laid out the chakra ink and parchment with a sense of reverence. Next, he unfurled two scrolls and placed them next to his latest purchases. The first scroll contained information about the enclosing technique. The technique was a versatile method that allowed the user to seal a wide array of objects, living beings, or even ninjutsu into scrolls or small sheets of paper. Chakra paper was recommended because it conducted chakra better and improved the success rate of seals. This technique enabled the storage of items or abilities in a condensed form, making them easily transportable or deployable at a later time. The process involved outlining specific symbols and applying chakra to create a seal that connects to a designated scroll. Once the seal was activated, the enclosed contents would be effectively transferred into the chosen medium. This is a basic technique. It's good that it enables the storage of both living and non-living beings. This adaptability allows for creative applications, whether it's for storage, transportation, or even ninjutsu in a controlled manner. Just like Kisame stored living sharks in his water prison jutsu. Storing such ninjutsu saves up on chakra, so that's a plus. With enough creativity, even such low-rank techniques can perform miracles. The second scroll contained information about the unsealing technique. Just like the enclosing technique, it was a derank technique that Shinobi employed to reverse the effects of enclosing techniques, allowing them to retrieve and release what has been previously sealed within a scroll or, in some instances, a sheet of paper. They are two sides of the same coin. No wonder they are the hello world of Fuinjutsu. To perform it all, I need to do is apply chakra to the seal, to unravel the intricacies of the sealing pattern and nullify its effects. The process needs a precise understanding of the enclosing technique, as well as proficiency in unraveling the chakra bindings that hold the stored contents in place. Learning these two would basically be inscribing a storage seal. The chakra infused opens up a storage dimension that stores the items through enclosing and retrieves them back through unsealing. With a deep breath, Renjiro steadied his hand and dipped the quill into the chakra ink. The first stroke traced the outline of the seal for the enclosing technique. The symbols, born from a fusion of ink and chakra, 
flowed effortlessly from his hand, each stroke testifying to the hours spent mastering the calligraphy of Fu and Jutsu. As the seal neared completion, a surge of satisfaction filled Renjiro. Now, what should I store? Renjiro set his sights on experimenting with the types of items he could store within the intricate seals. His first experiment involved non-living beings, objects that served as preliminary tests. Renjiro selected simple tools to gauge the versatility of the storage seals. As Renjiro infused chakra into the seals, he observed the subtle glow that accompanied the successful activation of the enclosing technique. The once tangible objects now existed within the mystical confines of the scroll. Renjiro kept piling up objects into the seals. This continued until the objects could no longer be stored on the seal. I knew the storage dimension always had limits unless there would be a seal similar to the Kamui. But the accepted weight is around 40 kilograms, 88 pounds, which is rather disappointing. Considering the puppeteers of Suna Yu storage seals, there's must have an upper limit. Satisfied with the initial results, Renjiro's curiosity grew. Now, the focus shifted to living beings, rats, small and agile, serving as test subjects for the more intricate aspects of the enclosing technique. As he tried to seal the rat, he felt some sort of resistance at first, but he decided to use brute force to overcome the resistance. After sealing the rat, he quickly inscribed the unsealing technique. The symbols for unsealing, etched in his mind, flowed seamlessly from quill to parchment. The relations between the two techniques worked like keys and locks where the lock was the enclosing technique. The unseal technique was the key where you had to overlay it on the enclosing seal. Doing so all the objects previously stored came out and Renjiro anxiously examined the stored rat. To his disappointment, the rat had died. Makes sense. The resistance I faced was probably a hint that it would not work. The rat probably died from the lack of oxygen in the other dimension. But if it kills a living being, why haven't people used this as a way to end fights? Just imagine fighting someone like Madara and just sealing him wouldn't he die? That would be a pipe dream, I think because the difference in chakra reserves of the target and user would have to be on different levels. Secondly, did Edo Tensei qualify them as living beings? Realizing that he was veering off from his current objective, Renjiro decided to finish up on his experiment. Now since these two parts work, I need to make the storage seal, which effectively combines the two techniques. As Renjiro concluded his initial experiments, a sense of accomplishment and humility washed over him. The two techniques, once abstract, now materialized before him in seal form. He now had to move to the storage seal. But just as he was going to, a loud knocking on Renjiro's door reverberated through the quietude of the room he was in, interrupting his concentration. The unexpected interruption drew Renjiro's attention away from the scrolls and symbols that had captivated his focus. Who could it be, I did not even sense their arrival. Renjiro had formed a habit of activating his chakra field whenever he was at home. Sato had advised him to do this as a way to keep training his sensory abilities. Currently, his chakra field was at 30 meters. Renjiro approached the door. As he swung the door open, the sight that greeted him was as enigmatic as it was imposing. An Umbu ninja, clad in the anonymity of their distinctive mask and uniform stared back at Renjiro. The Umbu ninja's mask bore the visage of a wolf. Stray strands of hair peeked out from beneath the hood, adding an element of mystery to the Umbu's appearance. The Umbu ninja wasted no time in delivering their message. Their voice, muffled by the mask, held an authoritative tone that brooked no argument. Uzumaki Renjiro, your presence is required, who might be behind this? Daichi-sama? No, this is an Umbu. Maybe it's the Hokage. But why would he want to see me? And at this ungodly time. A cascade of thoughts tumbled through Renjiro's mind but the urgency conveyed by the Umbu's presence left little room for hesitation. Renjiro nodded in acknowledgement, and without uttering a word, locked up his house. With a final glance, Renjiro found himself enveloped in the seamless cloak as the Umbu initiated the body flicker technique. This is fast. It is actually disorienting. In an instant, the surroundings blurred into moving streaks as they traversed the hidden paths of Konoha. Due to his limited experience with body flicker jutsu, Renjiro could barely perceive the direction they were heading amid the swift transitions. Where the hell am I? The abrupt cessation of the technique left Renjiro momentarily disoriented, 
his senses took time to readjust to the stillness. As he gathered his bearings, he cast a discerning gaze around, attempting to discern the location they stopped at. The umbu gestured toward a nondescript complex. A complex? Does someone leave here? The subtle architectural cues that hung in the air hinted at the residence of someone within the village. Rinjiro, though unsure of the specifics, could sense the familiarity that clung to the group of buildings. The umbu's silent guidance ushered Renjiro toward the entrance. With a quiet acknowledgement, he stepped into the building, the door closing behind him with a muted thud. The interior was bathed in the soft glow of ambient light. As they walked through the quiet corridors, the umbu eventually halted before a closed door. Then knocked on the door. Immediately, they heard an undistinguishable voice inviting them in. The umbu chose to stay behind and Renjiro had to proceed alone. Well here goes nothing, as Renjiro stepped into the room, the ambience shifted from the muted tones of the corridor to a space that seemed to hold a peculiar vibrancy. A low table adorned with scattered scrolls and ninja tools stood at the center, serving as the focal point of the room's activity. Seems like someone's room, but who could it be? In the midst of this carefully arranged room, Renjiro's gaze fell upon a figure. At first, she was unrecognizable, but after seeing vibrant red hair, Renjiro had a pretty good guess who it was. It was Uzumaki Kushina, the current Nine Tails Jinchuriki. The renowned Kunoichi sat in a poised manner on a cushion near the low table. The room seemed to come alive with the intensity of her presence as if the very air crackled with her boundless energy. Kushina, clad in traditional ninja attire that bore the Uzumaki crest, exuded an aura of both strength and warmth. Her piercing blue eyes were framed by a cascade of crimson hair. A headband adorned with the emblem of Kanoha rested atop her forehead. The scrolls on the table bore markings and symbols, suggesting a discourse into matters of significance. Kushina, in the midst of this, appeared engrossed in them, her attention focused on the scrolls before her. I knew Uzumaki's had a strong life force, but this is a bit overbearing. If she's like this then how is it standing before Hashirama? Could Kurama be adding to this aura that I feel? But why am I here? Kushina, aware of Renjiro's arrival, looked up from the scrolls with a warm yet appraising gaze. A faint smile played on her lips. Uzumaki Renjiro, I have been waiting for you. Good evening. It's good you were brought to Kanoha, it was getting lonely here. E, big sister, may I know who you are and why I was required to come here? Renjiro replied to Kushina in the most respectable way he could. He could not let it be known outrightly, that he knew who he was speaking to as he was sure the umbu protecting her were watching which might arouse suspicion. Renjiro decided to use the term big sister as he could ascertain the age gap between them was not that large so Kushina should be in her early teens. Lord Third informed me that you had requested or a few Injutsu tutor, or was that not the case? Who it is about that, it had almost slipped my mind. Kushina must have already taught Minato Fuinjutsu, so she should be an expert in the Fuinjutsu field. Yes, it was. I had asked for a Fuinjutsu tutor as the prize from my genin rank promotion. Good to know, but why do you want to learn Fuinjutsu? Kushina asked with her gaze locking onto Renjiro with a mixture of warmth and intensity. Because I want to. Renjiro plainly answered. For a minute there Kushina did not know what to say. What is happening? No. This was not supposed to be happening. He was to have a grand reason, then I would somehow discredit it. But he is still a child. What was I expecting? Meanwhile, Renjiro just stared back at her, he had thought of ways to bullshit his way out of this but couldn't think of one. Instead of wasting time, he just decided to play dumb. Ooh, I almost forgot, how can I claim to be your future master before introducing myself, I am Uzumaki Kushina. Uzumaki? Renjiro asked, completely committing to the role. Yes, I was born in Yuzushiogakure but relocated to Konoha, Kushina's voice momentarily turned somber at the mention of Yuzushio. And as a Fuinjutsu Grandmaster, you should be able to learn quite a few things from me. A Grandmaster huh? She's quite young to be one. But considering that she was partly the reason Minato excelled in Fuinjutsu, it not far-fetched. Before he could fully absorb the weight of her words, Kushina's demeanor took a subtle turn. A mischievous glint danced in her eyes, and a sly smile played on her lips. All right, Renjiro, she said. But before we dive into the scrolls and seals, let's see just how well you handle a bit of the unexpected. 
Fuinjutsu is as much about adaptability as it is about precision. With a swift movement, Kushina retrieved a set of unmarked scrolls from the table. Consider this a warm-up, she remarked, extending the scrolls toward him. A warm-up to what? Rinjiro lamented, he had just started working on his Fuinjutsu and now here he was being asked to adapt. Let alone adapt, he had not yet made one fully functional seal. Show me what you can do, and we'll see if you're ready for the real lessons. Renjiro, though still processing the rapid turns of the conversation, accepted the scrolls with a determined nod. As he unrolled the first scroll, a complex array of symbols greeted his eyes. Kushina observed with keen interest, her gaze unyielding yet encouraging. So, Renjiro, what do you make of this, she inquired, her voice a steady undercurrent in the room. Remember, Fuinjutsu isn't just about the symbols, it's about the intent and the finesse with which you weave them into the fabric of your techniques. Rinjiro's eyes flicked back and forth between the unmarked scrolls and Kushina. What does she expect me to do? What's the matter, Rinjiro? Kushina inquired her tone a blend of curiosity and encouragement. Is there something on your mind? Rinjiro, meeting her gaze, admitted, I. I only know two D-rank techniques when it comes to Fuinjutsu. I haven't even created any seals of my own. Only two techniques, huh? This is going to be harder than I expected. Kushina decided to delve into the specifics. Alright, Renjiro. Tell me which Fuinjutsu techniques you're familiar with. Renjiro met her gaze. I only know the enclosing and unsealing techniques. Those are the D-rank techniques I've been practicing. Only those two? I had expected a basic storage scroll and the like. But it seems like he is a total greenhorn when it comes to this. Inasmuch as it is going to make things tough for me, I can't really blame him as at his age he does not have anyone to guide him. His self-initiative itself should be commended. Kushina nodded, her disappointment giving way to a measured sense of acceptance. In closing and unsealing, huh? Not bad for a start. Those techniques are the foundational blocks of almost every seal. Let's see how well you can apply them in this challenge. I'm still going to do this test? I thought admitting I don't know anything would get me out of this. Noticing Renjiro's hesitation, Kushina decided to encourage him, don't worry Renjiro, we'll work with what we have. Let's see how well you can apply what you know. I'll just wing it. Renjiro took the scrolls in front of him and began to study them. The intricate seal matrices sprawled across the scroll, and though initially daunting, Renjiro's determination and background in programming provided him with a unique perspective. As he examined the first seal matrix, he noted the arrangement of symbols and the interplay of chakra signatures. Symbols are code, so I just have to determine the underlying logic. Huh? Doesn't this look familiar to the fire kanji? Could it be sealing the ninjutsu? That would make perfect sense, but there are a lot of components in these matrices that are confusing. Just like the first matrix, Rinjiro found three more matrices similar to it with the only difference being that they had water and earth. This further proved his theory of them sealing elemental ninjutsu. However, the last two were different from the rest. These two are similar, but just like the rest, they have components that I do not recognize. The only good thing about them that I recognize are the enclosing and unsealing techniques. They do not have any common kanji so they do not seal any ninjutsu. Kushina, observing Renjiro's focused demeanor, raised an eyebrow in curiosity. What do you think these matrices do? Renjiro pointed to specific elements in the scroll. These three appear to be an elemental sealing technique, focusing on the principles of fire, water and earth as they contain similar symbols to their kanji. While these two are similar in the components used. Other than that, I can't say what they do since I only recognize a few components in the matrix. Kushina couldn't help but be impressed. Her initial disappointment transformed into genuine respect for the genin's analytical prowess. Fuinjutsu was slowly starting to be considered a dying art in the last couple of years, as not many people could understand the seals employed. Together with the fact that there were not many people dabbing in the art led to its decline. The only saving grace was that due to its high entry requirements, even decent talent was greatly appreciated due to the convenience it brought. Exceptional talent in the field could lead to progress as only creativity was the limit. Well, and other laws of reality. He got most of them correct. His attention to detail is ingenious. Maybe this would not be as troublesome as I thought. 
Well, Renjiro, she remarked with a smile, I must say, your performance is quite impressive, especially considering your limited exposure to Fuinjutsu. What were the last two seal matrices for? Renjiro questioned. They were both storage seals. They just differ in levels as one was basic and the other was advanced. Hearing the explanation, Renjiro was visibly surprised. I thought that basic storage scroll was only made up of enclosing and unsealing. Seeing Renjiro's reaction, Kushina caught on to what he was thinking of. The other components you saw were used to improve the effects of the seal. The three components were other techniques similar to the two that you know. All Fuinjutsu is a variation of combining the five techniques. But why were they not recorded on the books I read back at the library? Renjiro, you are still a genin. I am sure if you were a jounin, you would have this information. Villages can't share information wantonly with genins because they could easily defect to other villages or even worse become rogue. Understandable. It's a merit system. The more you can give to the village, the more the village trusts you. Anyway, let's focus on the three techniques I mentioned, Kushina began, let's talk about the first one, the transfer technique. It's one of the foundations of Fuinjutsu, the very essence that allows chakra to flow through seals. Every seal you encounter has essentially used this type of technique or its variations, facilitating the movement of chakra to achieve its intended purpose. The next one is the controller technique. Picture it as an intricate loop, a mechanism that periodically sends bursts of chakra through the transfer technique. This is where your control and precision come into play. You can regulate the flow of chakra, determining when and how much is released. It's a skill that evolves with practice and mastery. And last but not least, we have the linkage technique, Kushina explained. This one's about connections. Imagine setting up pairs of seals that can communicate with each other through small, continuous pulses of chakra. These pairs are used to establish and release links between seals, creating a network of coordinated actions. Renjiro absorbed the information, his eyes reflecting a mix of curiosity and determination. Kushina smiled, recognizing the spark of enthusiasm in the young ninja. Remember, Fuinjutsu is all about understanding these fundamental principles and using them creatively. The enclosing technique and the unsealing technique are just the beginning. As you delve into the intricacies of transfer, controller, and linkage techniques, you'll unlock a world of possibilities within the art of sealing. Oh! Now I get it. Adding these three components, one can make the storage seal. Since it is a basic scroll, modifying the components could lead to the birth of other seals. But if the storage seal is made up of the five components, then how do they fit together? Because the size of the matrix would be too huge to be accommodated in the small chakra paper they usually come in. As the question lingered on his thoughts, he turned to Kushina and inquired, how do we fit all these techniques together? The seal's matrix can get quite large if we use all the components. Kushina, with a reassuring smile, nodded in understanding. Rinjiro, that's where the concept of seal compression comes into play. Think of it as a way to condense the size of a seal matrix using your chakra. It's about efficiency and making the seals more manageable while still retaining their functionality. She continued, when you engage seal compression, you're essentially weaving your chakra through the intricate patterns of the seal matrix. The goal is to compress the essential elements without losing the seal's intended purpose. This results in a smaller, more discrete seal that remains challenging for others to comprehend due to intentional compression. All this you will learn in due time. I will make sure to teach you the Uzumaki way of Fuinjutsu. As Renjiro left Kushina's home that night, he couldn't help but feel a tiny sense of accomplishment. He was a step closer to his goal of growing in power and having Kushina tutor him in Fuinjutsu would help him have more tools to use in his arsenal. They had already created a schedule where they would have their Fuinjutsu lessons. Since they both had other duties, they would meet late in the evening for their classes. You have to feel sorry for Kushina. Although she's being treated better than another Kanoha Jinchuriki, she is still being isolated from the village. That must be quite a lonely life. Anyway, Shadow Clone Jutsu will help me keep up with my training despite the reduced free time. I should probably use it to learn more Jutsus. With the Riku's training being demanding, I should probably use it when I'm with Kushina. That will be the better option as we will start Fuinjutsu training by first going through the basics. So more theory for me. 
It was early in the morning at training ground 51 and as usual, the team was having their training with Riku. Guys, Riku began, his gaze sweeping across the trio, it's good that you've shown promise with the body flicker technique. Although everyone has a fair mastery of it, it does not mean that you should slack off. Just keep getting better at it as it will pay off in the long run. Now, let's talk about boosting your team synergy. Although the team synergy has improved since we started training, it still has a long way to go. Communication is key. Always keep each other informed about your positions, strategies, and any changes in the plan. This way, you'll move as one cohesive unit. Aiko, your proficiency in ninjutsu and genjutsu is solid. But you explore some more winjutsus to add versatility to your arsenal. Rinjiro, Riku addressed the Uzumaki, you should consider delving into wind jutsus that can complement Aiko's fire nature. Wind and fire can create a powerful combination. This way, you can amplify the impact of Aiko's fire jutsus during battles. Hiro, you seem not like ninjutsu since your taijutsu is your strength. However, only the strong have the luxury of choosing. You should really work on your ninjutsu. Enhancing your strikes with the solid defense of earth-based jutsus or surprising your opponents with a swift combination of both could be viable options. Renjiro, Aiko, and Hiro nodded in unison, absorbing Riku's advice. His insights were more than welcome to the three. However, Renjiro had other ideas. I'll still focus on fire jutsus. Not doing so will be a bad idea. If ever find myself in a situation where I am alone having jutsus from those two affinities will increase my offense capabilities. After that, Riku dismissed the team. He advised them to pay attention to their personal training, as that would be the key to their development as shinobis. As Riku was about to leave, Renjiro approached him with a query about incorporating the staff, Bo, into his fighting style. Riku-sensei, Renjiro inquired, I've been considering adding the staff into my fighting style. Should I go through with it? And how does it compare to other styles? Riku nodded, using a staff, or bois, has its advantages and drawbacks, just like any other fighting style. Riku took a moment to consider Renjiro's suggestion before saying, I cannot say that I am an expert in using weapons, but what I know is that they offer a combination of offense, defense, and versatility. The essential to weigh the pros and cons. Firstly, Riku began, the staff provides extended reach, allowing you to engage opponents from a safer distance. It's also excellent for controlling the battlefield. The only disadvantage I can think of is it might be cumbersome in close quarters combat, and it requires precision to wield effectively. This will also force you to modify the taijutsu style you use to accommodate it. It will be hard as only the Hataki Taijutsu style caters for weapon use during fights. Riku then drew a parallel with the Hokage's fights, a reference point familiar to Renjiro. I am not sure if you know this, but Lord Third uses the staff to supplement his Taijutsu, so he should be the best person who can answer your questions about this. Guess most people only know the staff as a weapon and not as a summon. Or maybe they do but it is only known by specific jonins and clan heads. Riku continued, similarly, your choice of weapon influences your fighting style. If you lean towards the bow, you will need to master its techniques, incorporating fluid strikes and precise movements. It might not be as flashy, but it can be just as effective if wielded skillfully. Riku concluded, ultimately, the choice is yours. Explore its strengths and limitations, and see how it complements your existing skills. The best I can do is start helping you with evasion tactics when you face shinobi who use weapons or even the samurai. But that would be after our daily training. Thank you, Rika-sensei, for offering to help me with my boy training. I'm eager to explore this new dimension in my fighting style. After I get one then we can start. Riku, with a nod and a reassuring smile, alright, once you get your own staff just let me know then we can set things in place. As the days unfolded with intense training in Training Ground 51, the team found themselves immersed in a week of dedicated preparation. However, they faced an unexpected announcement during one of their training sessions. Riku gathered the team together. Your performance during our training has improved and I think it's time for your first mission. The announcement hung in the air, momentarily eclipsing the sounds of training. Renjiro, Aiko, and Hiro exchanged glances, a mixture of excitement and anticipation reflected in their eyes. Finally. I have been waiting for this. Besides the pain, the training was becoming boring. 
Renjiro surmised. With the revelation that their first mission awaited them, Riku gave them time to prepare and they agreed to meet the next day. Once everyone arrived the next day, alright, let's make our way to the mission center. That's where we'll receive the details of our assignment. The excitement from getting their first mission was so palpable that the three genins even forgot how worn out their bodies were from Riku's training. Yeah, getting a mission is fine but are we going to go complete the mission in our current conditions? Questions arose in Renjiro's head but he chose to trust in Riku as he was sure that he would have accounted for that. Maybe he knows but he just doesn't care. Since it is our first mission, it should be low ranked, so what's the worst that could happen? Ignoring the flags he was raising, Renjiro followed the rest to the mission center. Upon reaching the mission center, which was in the Hokage building, the team gathered around the reception area. This was a pleasant experience as it was Renjiro's first time in this building. Riku approached the mission coordinator, exchanging pleasantries and presenting the necessary credentials. The mission coordinator was Mahito, a chunin who after witnessing the dangers of the field chose to pursue a desk-related job. He was holding a stack of mission scrolls at hand and greeted them. Team 15, I've been expecting you. This should include all the necessary mission details. Mahito handed over a sealed scroll containing the details of their mission. Riku accepted the scroll. Riku unfurled the scroll and read its contents. Hmm. This should be easy. With Riku holding the sealed scroll containing the details of their first mission, a palpable sense of suspense and anticipation enveloped the trio. Riku said, this one's a straightforward mission, nothing too complicated. You should all be able to handle it with ease. His casual assurance only deepened the suspense for the Genins. Hiro couldn't help but remark, this isn't good guys. If Rika-sensei says a mission is easy, it's probably anything but that. I mean, look at our daily training sessions. Easy isn't exactly a word I'd associate with those. Aiko, nodding in agreement, added, yeah, it's like he thrives on pushing us to our limits. Easy for Rika-sensei might be a whole different level for us. Rika's eye twitched. I can hear them. Since they were a couple of meters away from Mahito and Riku, the Genins decided to mutter amongst them. Oblivious to the fact that Riku could hear them. Renjiro finally chimed in, well, whatever it is, we'll handle it. We've been through tough training together, and a mission should be no different. It's probably going to be the usual bandit clearing mission. I don't know why Hiro and Aiko are worried. Riku returned and instead of conveying the details of the mission, he passed the scroll to Renjiro and instructed him to read the mission details out loud for the other two to listen. As Renjiro unfolded the scroll and began to read aloud, the mission details unfolded before Team 15. This is a D-rank mission. You are tasked with escorting Hozuki Fakinchi on his journey back to Yorinaka village in the land of soups. Why are we escorting this Hozuki Fakinchi? Hiro inquired. Renjiro responded, it seems like Hozuki Fakinchi is a representative from Yorinaka village, and he has been attending diplomatic meetings here in Kanoha. Now, it's our responsibility to ensure his safe return home. Riku, observing his team's reactions, added, indeed. While the mission is easy, we must stay vigilant. Our task is not just to escort but to guarantee the safety of Hozuki Fakinchi. Head back home and get everything in order. Escort missions can take time, and it's crucial to be well prepared for any situation. Ensure you have the necessary supplies, equipment, and a strategic plan in place. The team nodded in acknowledgement. They dispersed with each member making their way to their respective homes to gather essentials for the mission. Renjiro did not go home immediately but made his way to Kushina's residence, a place where he had been expanding his knowledge of Fuinjutsu recently. Kushina sensei, I've got a mission coming up, so we will have to postpone our Fuinjutsu classes until I get back. I hope you understand. Renjiro said the moment he saw Kushina. Kushina nodded understandingly. Of course, Renjiro. Your mission comes first. Stay safe, and we can resume our training when you return. Renjiro then headed to inform Sora, his former classmate who was still in the academy, to relay the message to Miwa. It had been quite some time since they last spoke as she was still in the academy and Renjiro had to focus on his genin training. After a bit of catching up, Renjiro passed on the information to Sora who promised to notify Miwa the moment she returned back to the village from her mission. 
With every errand completed, Renjiro headed home, packed the essentials and rested the night away. At dawn the following morning, the members of Team 15 reconvened at the village gate as they prepared to embark on their mission. Renjiro, carrying a backpack with his essentials, approached Aiko and Hiro, who were already present. He had mainly packed extra kunais and clothes. He was still working on his fuenjutsu, so he chose to wait until he could make his own storage seals instead of buying them. Yes, Renjiro was cheap. Inasmuch as this is this is just the village gate, it's still nostalgic. Not in the sense that I have been here, but it is exactly how it was depicted in the anime. Although I was only here a couple of years ago when Miwa brought me to Konoha, the sentiment is still there. Just as Renjiro was reminiscing, Riku arrived as the last member of their group, Good morning guys, are you ready? The team returned his greeting. Inwardly, they were all wishing that he would keep the same spirit of punctuality during their daily training. Hozuki Fikinchi, the merchant they were tasked to accompany, arrived at the village gate. His presence marked the commencement of their journey, and with a brisk pace, he approached Team 15. Ah, Riku-san, isn't it? Fakinchi greeted them, a sense of urgency in his tone. I appreciate your assistance in this matter. Time is of the essence, and I'm already behind schedule. Let's not linger. We must get going immediately. Renjiro, Aiko, and Hiro exchanged glances, acknowledging the merchant's urgency. Riku nodded in agreement. We're ready to proceed, Fakinchi-san. We will ensure a safe journey to Yorinaka village. Riku said before turning to his team, all right, fall into formation. Team 15 fell into formation, with Riku maintaining a vigilant position at the rear. While Renjiro was at the center with Aiko and Hiro both covering the flanks. The initial part of the journey unfolded with a sense of monotony, with the terrain stretching before the team and Hozuki Fakinchi. The merchant attempted to break the silence with small talk, discussing various aspects of his business and the peculiarities of Yorinaka village's culinary delights. Renjiro, Aiko, and Hiro listened attentively, their focus never wavering from their duty. As the landscape transitioned and the team approached their destination, an unexpected twist disrupted the mundane rhythm of the journey. Renjiro sensed a couple of chakra signatures ahead of them and immediately turned to Riku. We have a couple of people ahead of us, Riku calmly whispered to the group. He did not want them to change their formation as that would alert the enemy. Renjiro, can you ascertain their power levels? Yes, from their chakra signature intensity, they seem to be genins and at best a chunin should be among them, Renjiro said. He could not get an accurate reading as he had activated his chakra field the moment they left the village. The mental fatigue accumulated in these four hours of travel was getting to him. You guys prepare yourselves to deal with them. I will stay with Hozuki to keep him safe. Don't worry if things escalate, I will step in. Riku assured the team. They continued walking and it did not take long for the bandits to make themselves known. The bandits, armed with makeshift weapons, surrounded the convoy with menacing grins. Hozuki Fakinchi's expression shifted from mild calmness to one of concern, realizing the imminent threat that now loomed before them. He was not worried when he heard that an enemy was near since he was being guarded by Kanoha ninjas, which he had faith in. Only after he saw the bandits did his faith begin to waver. I should have asked for more security. I do not know why I thought the information of the package wouldn't get out. Hozuki continued to lament. It seemed that there was more than meets the eye to their escort mission. Renjiro, Aiko, and Hiro instinctively shifted into combat stances, ready for the unexpected turn of events. Riku, too, maintained a composed demeanor. The bandits, with their scruffy leader at the forefront, had surrounded Team 25 and Hozuki Fakinchi. Hand over your valuables, and maybe we'll let you continue on your journey, the bandit leader sneered, his eyes scanning the convoy. Renjiro, Aiko, and Hiro remained steadfast, their hands poised over weapons, ready for the signal to strike. Riku, their sensei, maintained a calm composure, aware that this seemingly routine escort mission had taken an unexpected turn. He is a Jounin. This is going to be extremely hard. He is a Jounin. This is going to be extremely hard. It was supposed to be a D-rank mission. All that easy talk probably jinxed us. But why would a Jounin attack a normal merchant? Now that the group was nearer, Renjiro could ascertain their power levels. He went on high alert as they were totally outnumbered and overpowered. 
The enemy group consisted of 1 Jounin, 2 Chunins and 10 Jenins bringing their total number to 13 assailants. It was 13 versus 4 which was not fair as they still hard to ensure Hozuki came out of this alive. There's a Jonin amongst them. This might be tougher than expected. I doubt this will end peacefully. The best I can do is take initiative and try to control the chaos that would ensue. Riku thought after catching on with the situation. Earth Pulse. With a swift and decisive movement, Riku slammed his hands into the ground, channeling chakra into the earth beneath. With a sudden and powerful surge, the ground beneath the bandits pulsed with chakra. Earth spikes erupted in unpredictable patterns and locations, aiming to catch the unsuspecting opponents off guard. The element of surprise was Riku's strategy, a calculated move to gain the upper hand in the confrontation. The Earth Pulse Jutsu exhibited a unique manifestation on the battlefield. Unlike the conventional Earth Spike Jutsu that simply formed spikes from the ground, the Earth Pulse introduced a layer of complexity and unpredictability. The formation of Earth Spikes was not a constant presence, rather, they appeared and disappeared with unpredictable timing, mimicking the rhythmic pulse of a heartbeat. Their formation was unpredictable, but with more chakra, the user could control the spike formation. Unfortunately, with the bandits being in front of him, Riku did not have to worry about this. The destruction of the Jutsu resulted in a gruesome outcome for four unfortunate Genins among the bandits. They were impaled to death, unable to react in time to the relentless assault of spikes that emerged unexpectedly from the ground. The remaining bandits, however, showcased a level of skill and keen senses that allowed them to evade the lethal spikes. Recognizing the incoming danger, they flickered back a couple of meters with swift movements, strategically placing themselves beyond the Jutsu's immediate range. Capitalizing on the chaos and distraction caused by the Earth Pulse Jutsu, Riku swiftly moved into action. With a burst of smoke, two Shadow Clones materialized. The first Shadow Clone remained by Hozuki Fakinchi's side, ensuring the safety of the merchant and the precious cargo of Chakra Metal. Since that was their mission after all. The second Shadow Clone headed towards the remaining bandit Chunins. The original Riku directed his attention towards the hostile Jonin. Damn it! Shoko remarked. After he witnessed the fall of his subordinates and the emergence of Riku's Shadow Clones, a sense of urgency overcame him. Determined to turn the tide, Shoko swiftly performed hand seals, creating Earth Clones to bolster their ranks and overpower the Kanoha Shinobi. The newly formed Earth Clones moved to overwhelm the Genins. However, Riku, demonstrating his seasoned expertise, quickly got rid of them gracefully as he closed in on Shoko and engaged him in combat. Renjiro, Aiko, and Hiro took their stances, ready to confront the opposition. They were now facing six enemy genins. Despite them being outnumbered in a 2 to 1 ratio, their confidence stemmed from the fact that they had Riku's shadow clone, which was guarding Hozuki, was with them. With Sensei's shadow clone, the odds are now even. They might even be in our favor. Renjiro surmised. He was grateful that Riku had shouldered the burden of facing the Jounin and Chunins as that was way above their pay grade. His optimism, however, was short-lived. Riku's clone, maintaining a calm demeanor, addressed the young Genins. I'll only step in if you're in real danger. You've got the skills to handle this. Don't rely on me unless you need it. Renjiro, surprised, asked, wait, what? But we thought you were here to help us. The Riku clone chuckled, I'm here mainly for Hozuki's safety. You won't improve if I do all the work for you. Face them with the skills you've learned in our training sessions. On hearing this, Hozuki's nerves calmed down. Unfortunately, this reaction wasn't shared by the Genins. Aiko, slightly frustrated, questioned, so, we're on our own? The clone responded, pretty much so. But if things get too tough, I'll step in. For now, show me what you're made of. What's the difference between that and being alone? Renjiro complained as he focused his chakra and created three shadow clones from a third of his chakra. Two of the shadow clones engaged one of the enemy genins. The shadow clones spammed the great fireball and airbus jutsu, aiming to hold off their opponent while Renjiro and the last clone fought another genin. The enemy genins were young adults, which showed that they lacked when it came to shinobi skills otherwise they would not still be genins. But don't be fooled, this did not in any way mean that this would be an easy fight for Team 15 despite each of them taking on two Genins. 
the enemy Genins had greater battle experience than them, whose battle experiences were limited to their daily training sessions and spars they had between themselves. Therefore, taking on two experienced Genins would be a tall order for each of them. I need to finish this quickly and help the rest. Feeling the weight of the battle, Renjiro recognized the need to tip the scales in their favor. With a determined focus, he activated his Sharingan. Simultaneously, so did the clone he was fighting with. Should the other clones use the Sharingan? No, I should conserve my chakra just in case something bad happens later. While the possibility of his clones using his dojitsu existed, Renjiro chose not to pursue it. Doing so would cause a strain, on both his reserves and mental fortitude, that could render him unconscious if prolonged in use. This he had learned the harder way the minute he had mastered the shadow clone jutsu. He was still hopeful that as he grew, he would be able to use this combination more freely. With his Sharingan now active, the enemy Genin, despite their battle-hardened experience, found it hard to keep up with his enhanced reflexes and a preternatural understanding of their actions. An Uchiha? I should be careful not to look at his eyes. Renjiro's opponent thought the minute he saw his Sharingan. As the battle unfolded, Renjiro's Sharingan allowed him to anticipate the subtle cues and shifts in his enemy's movements. Every feint, every strike, and every evasion became clear to him, enabling Renjiro to navigate the battlefield with a level of foresight that bridged the experience gap. With the taste of victory lingering, Renjiro swiftly concluded his duel against his opponent. With a decisive move, he used his kunai to incapacitate the enemy Genin, by stabbing it in his throat. Having secured his victory, Renjiro rejoined his shadow clones, their collective efforts now focused on the remaining enemy genins. The shadow clones, synchronized by their creator, executed a seamless combination of ninjutsu, taijutsu, and strategic maneuvers, and eventually got the upper hand with the genin meeting a similar end to his recently deceased colleague. Renjiro then turned his attention to his teammates. They are actually doing better than I anticipated. He concluded upon seeing Aiko showcasing her expertise in Jinjutsu. She used Jinjutsu, disorienting and confusing the enemy genins she was facing. Hiro was utilizing his Taijutsu skills and Earth Jutsu for defense, showcasing a stalwart resilience that complemented the team's overall strategy. It did not help that the enemies were also using Earth Jutsus, but it served him well enough to stall them. With Renjiro's timely assistance, the tide turned definitively in Team 15's favor. The remaining enemy Genins found themselves outmaneuvered and overwhelmed by the coordinated efforts of the Genins and their shadow clones. As the Genins were fighting for their life, Riku was having an intense clash with Shoko. Seizing a momentary lull in their confrontation, Riku took the opportunity to probe for information, why are you targeting a normal merchant? That is even low for you? Riku questioned. Shoko, maintaining a guarded demeanor, retorted with a question of his own, and why would a normal merchant be walking around with chakra metal? Riku, momentarily taken aback, concealed his surprise behind a composed demeanor. The mention of chakra metal added a layer of complexity to the mission. If it was involved then this mission was no longer just a deranked mission. Shoko, evading Riku's attacks, maintained a cryptic demeanor. Maybe you're not as in the know as you think, Senju Wolf of Kanoha. Shoko taunted, a smirk playing on his lips as he observed Riku's reaction. The nickname was a moniker of the past that Riku gained during his exploits in the Second Shinobi War. Riku, regaining his composure, shot a sharp glance at Shoko. So, you've done your homework. Shoko chuckled, the banter intertwining with the intensity of their jutsu-laden duel. It's not every day you get to face a living legend. They say you tore through enemy lines like a wolf hunting its prey. Riku, maintaining a stoic demeanor, retorted, legends can be deceiving. What does my past have to do with this mission? Shoko replied, inasmuch as I'd like to test myself over you. I'm only here for the chakra metal. It was not strange that Shoko was not backing down. Chakra metal was a very precious metal. It's not just a valuable commodity, it's a source of power that can enhance the potency of various techniques. The elemental nations have, in the past, gone to war over control of chakra metal mines. The history of conflicts over such a precious resource highlighted the strategic importance placed on it. The mere fact that it had high chakra conduction made it a must-have ingredient when making bladed weapons for shinobi. 
So far he has been using Earth Jutsus both for offense and defense. Is he from IWA? Although he might be from another village, IWA is the most likely guess. If so why did they send him? As the battle raged on, Riku seized an opportune moment to pose a question to his adversary. Are you perhaps from Iwagakure, he inquired. Shoko assessed Riku with a measured gaze. The question lingered in the air, however, Shoko did not indulge Riku. He remained enigmatic, offering no verbal response. Riku, undeterred, continued to inquire, Rindo Shoko, Riku asked, his tone laced with a mixture of realization and inquiry. Is that the name you go by? Come on, just answer you already know about me. After all, this might be the last time we fight, at least for one of us. Riku's deduction regarding Shoko's identity was drawn from the information stored in the bingo book. The pages of the book held the story of Rindo Shoko, a figure whose standing in IWA changed with the turbulent aftermath of the Second Shinobi War. Rindo Shoko had gone rogue in the years following the war after a fallout with the Tsuchikage leading to the current path he was in. The bounty placed on Shoko's head was a sum of 2 million Ryo. While the amount might not hold significant allure for Riku, it was still enough to make Riku vow to collect it. But that was besides the point. Knowing that old man, Shoko might not even be a rogue shinobi. It was not surprising that villages could sacrifice their own shinobi by severing their ties with them, these very shinobi would become their pawns for information gathering and the sort. Seeing Shoko now become unresponsive, Riku heaved a sigh. He was all talk just a few minutes ago, now that I'm asking questions he become mute. Anyway, time to end this farce. With a determined gaze, Riku closed the distance between them in a blur of speed. He then launched a couple of strikes at Shoko. His strikes were a fusion of taijutsu precision and ninjutsu, a relentless onslaught that sought to break through Shoko's defenses. Shoko, though battered and on the defensive, maintained his demeanor. The rogue shinobi's resolve seemed unyielding, an enigma that frustrated Riku. Yet, undeterred, Riku channeled his frustration into his attacks, each blow fueled by the weight of unanswered questions. Back on the other side of the battle, Team 15 had already vanquished all their opponents and now turned their attention back to Hozuki Fukinchi and Riku's shadow clone, assessing the aftermath of the battle. The priority was to regroup with Hozuki and the clone, ensuring the safety of their client and completing the mission that had taken an unexpected turn. Hozuki-sama, Renjiro began, his tone measured but insistent, do you have any reason why they were targeting you? Hozuki, initially hesitant, found himself compelled to unveil the truth in the face of the genin's inquiries. He admitted, I. I. Chakra metal. I was transporting a significant quantity of chakra metal. The clone explained to them the significance of this since the genins were not privy to such information. The genins listened attentively, their expressions reflecting a mix of realization and understanding as they grasped the gravity of their mission. Ooh. So that's what the samurai used to make their weapons. Rinjiro remarked after he realized the scope of the situation. Meanwhile, Riku's clone did not see any reason to be there and so it dispelled itself. The reason it did so was to make sure Riku got his memories. The genins were not worried about this as they could pretty much tell its intentions. Not long after, Riku appeared before them. He approached them, a scroll clasped firmly in his hand. Without a moment's hesitation, he distributed scrolls to each member of Team 15. Take these scrolls, Riku instructed his voice a measured blend of authority and guidance. We need to secure the bodies of the bandits. Aiko voiced the unspoken question in their minds. Why do we need their bodies and how do we secure them, Sensei? Riku explained the strategic importance of their actions. The Yamanaka clan can use their bodies to access their memories. Extracting information from these bandits might unveil the motives behind their attack, potential connections, and any information. It could also show us how the leak of Hozuki and the chakra metal happened. So we need to quickly store their bodies. With a shared understanding, the genin set to work, efficiently following Riku's instructions. After they were done, Riku noticed the subtle change among the three genins. Looking at the genins his team faced, the realization hit him. How are you guys holding up? Riku inquired, his gaze shifting from one genin to another. The gravity of their recent experience was clear as all of them, in some way, had ended a life. Hiro broke the silence. It's, different, sensei. 
Ending lives wasn't something we didn't expect when we signed up for missions. But it still feels weird. Riku nodded, it's a part of the shinobi life, but it's crucial to process these experiences. If you ever need to talk about it, I'm here. It was only then that Renjiro put much thought into it. He was still running on adrenaline from the battle that he did not realize that he murdered people. This is real. This is no anime. I have to live with the fact that I am a murderer as well as a child soldier now. Renjiro tried to focus on more positive thoughts like he had come out of the conflict safe and sound but some sort of guilt managed to creep up on him. Hiro, meanwhile, simply nodded. Riku, sensing the unspoken emotions beneath the surface, continued to observe his team. After a moment of shared understanding, he redirected their focus to the mission at hand. Let's clear our tracks and move forward, Riku said, redirecting their attention to the uncompleted mission. The Genins nodded in agreement. As they swiftly erased any traces of their presence in the training ground, the echoes of the battle faded into the background. Team 15, now pressed forward, guided by their Jounin Sensei. The mission awaited completion, and the journey of these young shinobi continued, forged by the experiences that shaped them. Yorinaka village, nestled in the heart of the land of soups, presented a picturesque scene as the team and their escorted merchant, Hozuki Fikinchi, approached its boundaries. It was surrounded by rolling hills and lush greenery, the village boasted a serene ambience that belied the bustling life within. The village was a harmonious blend of traditional architecture and practical design. Wooden structures with sloping roofs stood in clusters, adorned with vibrant banners that fluttered in the gentle breeze. Streets weaved through the village like intricate webs, and lanterns dangled from awnings, casting a warm glow as the day began to wane. As they ventured deeper into Yorinaka, the aroma of simmering soups wafted through the air, creating an olfactory tapestry that defined the culinary essence of the region. Small shops and stalls lined the streets, offering an array of ingredients that reflected the village's dedication to the culinary arts. I guess from the name of the country, I should expect good soups. Renjiro mused. Hozuki Fikinchi navigated the familiar terrain with ease, leading them through the heart of the village. The village's central square, adorned with a communal cooking area, stood as a testament to the culinary expertise that defined Yorinaka and the land of soups in general. Upon reaching the heart of the village, Hozuki Fikinchi exchanged pleasantries with the local authorities, finalizing the completion of the mission. As the paperwork was concluded, Riku acknowledged the successful completion of their mission despite the disturbance they had along the way to Yorinaka. Take this evening to rest and rejuvenate, Riku addressed his team, the corners of his eyes softening with understanding. It was already getting late and after what the Genins had gone through, it would be better to give them a breather. You've earned it. Tomorrow, we will start our journey back to Kanoha. Ah yes, there he goes again. Renjiro thought after hearing Riku. If he could describe Riku in one word, it would be Enigma. This is because he was unpredictable. You never knew what to expect from him. One day was the good side, the next a calm side, and the other a sadistic side. The latter is shown mostly during their training. The former would actually make you forget he is a cold-blooded killer. Anyway, he gave us some time to rest. Can't complain. The Genins were grateful for the respite. They dispersed into the heart of Yorinaka village, each choosing their own way to unwind and absorb the unique atmosphere of the land of soups. Of course, they took on different appearances. The village leadership had already prepared lodging for them, so they did not have to worry about that, and they chose sightseeing. There was not much to see in the evening and after some time they both retired back to their rooms to rest. It was a long couple of days with the traveling and the fighting in between. The dawn of the next day found the Genins, led by their Jounin Sensei Riku, embarking on the journey back to Kanoha from Yorinaka village. The serene landscapes of the land of soups gradually transformed as they retraced their steps, leaving behind the picturesque charm of Yorinaka and headed back to the land of fire. The return journey was faster as compared to when they set out from Kanoha. Without a civilian slowing them down, Riku was determined to make them reach the village as soon as possible. Not due to some urgency, but because he just wanted to push them to their limits. Breaks for stopovers were few and far between, the emphasis shifting towards efficiency as they covered the distance with remarkable speed. The Genins adapted seamlessly to the brisk pace set by their sensei. They did not have any other option, as Riku threatened to leave them behind. 
That was not the bigger issue because they believed in their strength to survive in the wilderness. The issue was that they would be branded as deserters which was not good for any of them. The uneventful nature of their return journey stood in stark contrast to the challenges encountered during their mission to Yorinaka. Rinjiro even got himself wishing for some action. Any action. But the minute he realized what he was wishing for, he drove those intrusive thoughts away. Upon their return to Kanoha, they wasted no time in heading directly to the mission center within the Hokage building. Mahito, Renjiro began when they reached the mission center. We are done with the mission. Ah? Riku, you should have returned a day ago. Were there any delays? About that. The genin stood as witnesses to the process, observing with keen interest as Riku engaged in the mission report protocol. The Jounin efficiently conveyed the details of their escort mission, detailing the challenges faced, adversaries encountered, and the successful delivery of Hozuki to Yorinaka village. When Mahito heard of the attack, as well as chakra metal being involved, his face darkened as his gaze fell on the genins. A C-rank mission at the start? To put inexperienced genins in a such a situation is not good at all. It can't be helped, we live in difficult times. I just hope this does not scar them for life. As the mission report concluded, Mahito processed their mission reward. The initial remuneration set at 10,000 Rio underwent a significant adjustment, reflecting the increased complexity of the mission. The revised compensation was now standing at 70,000 Rio. Once the evaluation and remuneration adjustments were finalized, Mahito handed over the allocated funds to Riku. Here is your wages. It has been increased due to the mission rank being upgraded from D to C rank. About the other matter, you will have to inform Lord Third about it. Riku nodded as he took the money from Mahito. 70 zero zero Rio? How do I split it? They are still kids. They don't need this much money, right? Riku took the lion's share of the reward as he had most of the heavy lifting by defeating the Jounin, Chunin, and even some Jenins. His share was about two-thirds of the whole amount, and he left the remaining third for the Jenins to share equally. So much money, Aiko remarked after everyone got their share which was approximately 8,000 Rio. Renjiro could understand her. If he, who was getting a monthly allowance from the Uchiha clan could live off the amount for months, then the money could help an orphan civilian girl. But it is still not enough. When you accounted for all the ninja tools that they needed to replace after the mission, the money left would be barely enough to live off for a month. You've done well. Take some time to rest and recover. We'll reconvene for further training the day after tomorrow, Riku said before flickering away. As the genin began to disperse, Riku did not waste time as he headed towards the intelligence core to drop the bodies into the Hokage's office for obvious reasons. Chakra metal was an important issue. HAA. So this is how murderers feel? Renjiro thought as he entered his home. During the fight against the enemy genins, Renjiro killed three of the six genins they faced. Two of them were the ones he was initially facing while the other was one of the two Aiko was facing. After he was done with his opponents, he moved to help Aiko and then they helped Hiro finish his opponents. While they were facing the last two genins, Aiko killed one of them bringing her kill count to two and Hiro's to one. I know this is a kill or be killed world but it's just hard to adjust to such a thing on the get-go. But there are countless things that I never thought that I'd ever do that I've done since I came here. Like working out. I am not saying that it is the same thing. But maybe things get better from here on. Renjiro was trying whatever he could do to cope with the situation. Spending close to four years in this new year did not instantly overwrite his memories, behavior and beliefs he had when he was still on Earth. It was either you or them, Renjiro. Today it might have been them, but if you continue wallowing in this self-pity it might be you next time. With a slap on his cheeks to remind him of the stakes and that he should get his head back to the game, Renjiro felt reassured of better days. What to do now? It's still late in the afternoon, so I should first meditate then maybe I can work on my ninjutsu or fuinjutsu. Renjiro sat down in the lotus position and got into his mediation. Inasmuch as it helped him fill in his chakra reserves, which were drained with them traveling back, it was also a calming experience for him. Afterwards, he did a light workout consisting of the usual stretches, a hundred squats, sit-ups and push-ups followed by a 10-kilometer run, 6.2 miles. You know, a light workout. Feeling satisfied with the changes the whole process brought to him, 
both physically and mentally, Renjiro decided to start making seals on his own. He had already begun his practice on storage seals and after Kushina's commendation, he now felt confident in his abilities. With the ink and parchment at hand, he was now ready to make his first seal. The initial attempts proved to be daunting, each failure showing the complexity of few Injutsu. Renjiro persisted through the setbacks, fueled by the desire to master this art and add a new dimension to his repertoire of abilities. Countless hours were spent experimenting with various configurations, each attempt refining his understanding of the intricate interplay within the seal matrix. But Renjiro did not give up, he was trusting the process. I got the seal matrix, right, that I am sure of. But why is it not accepting the chakra that I am infusing? Is there an issue with the chakra pathways that I made? After a series of trials and errors, the breakthrough came with a successful creation. I finally did it. A surge of accomplishment coursed through him as he witnessed the tangible result of his efforts. The intricate dance of symbols of the seal now flowed with a newfound harmony creating the storage seal that he had worked so long to make. Eager to validate the practical efficacy of his newly crafted storage seal, Renjiro engaged in a meticulous testing process. He carefully selected a few non-essential items, items that wouldn't be missed if the seal failed to function as intended. Channeling chakra, he activated the seal, entrusting it with the task of securely storing the chosen items. Fortunately, the seal worked as intended. The items vanished from view, seamlessly tucked away within the concealed space defined by the Fuinjutsu. Does it have a limit to the storage space? Renjiro thought as he continued adding items to the storage seal. As he continued, Renjiro felt a tug deep within him. It was a very uncomfortable yet unexplainable feeling. Is this my chakra reacting to it? Blip. The storage seal was torn, and all the items Renjiro had entered to seal appeared. It does have a limit. But that was obvious, otherwise they wouldn't sell as they do. Everyone would just survive with one storage seal. But wait. Does my chakra act as an imprint that notifies me when it is almost full? I guess that's the only feasible explanation for the feeling I had earlier. If it is, then this world is blessed because it has the best form of security if they could somehow implement chakra signature recognition. But the fact that Zetsu can mimic chakra signature invalidates that idea. Renjiro continued with his experiments by seeing the restrictions on what types are allowed. Food and other inanimate items were allowed. When he tried to store a living thing by using a rat he found, when he retrieved it, the creature was already dead. Renjiro also tried to see whether he could store ninjutsu on the storage seals. It would be great if it did so because people would no longer monitor their chakra reserves levels whenever they fought. As long as they stored their prepared ninjutsus, then they would be fun. Despite the idea having so much utility potential, it did not work. The jutsu just dissipated whenever he tried to store it. It is kinda using energy to store energy but in a weird way. Anyway, Fuinjutsu is hard. It is basically like assembling part of a car, but you aren't told how the parts work. They just expect you to learn as you go. At least that's what I got from the book at the library. After all the tests, Renjiro decided to share his achievement with someone whose expertise in the field he deeply respected. That person was Uzumaki Kushina. He made two more storage seals and carefully secured the sealed items. Renjiro made his way to Kushina's place with a blend of excitement and anticipation. Since he had already gone there numerous times, he already knew the way. After flickering a couple of times, Renjiro arrived at Kushina's quarters. As he approached Kushina's room, he could hear muffled sounds. Although they knew each other, they did not know each other so well that Renjiro could simply barge into her room like a friend would do. Their relationship was that of a master and disciple, sort of. So Renjiro was required to show the bare minimum etiquette during their interactions. Knock, knock, knock. Renjiro rapped on the door. After numerous unanswered attempts, Renjiro wondered, why is she not answering? Let me just enter. Renjiro opened the door to the same view he always saw. The only difference was that there were two people in the room. When I told Sensei that Dash um, Renjiro? Are already done with your mission? Kushina asked as interrupted her guest. It seemed that she had a guest. Wait. It was then that Renjiro's gaze fell on the guest. It was a familiar face. As Renjiro stepped into Kushina's residence, he found himself face to face with a figure of Kanoha's future. 
It was Namike's Minato, the future fourth Hokage in the making, who stood before him. Minato's demeanor reflected a blend of determination and youthful exuberance. His golden hair, neatly arranged, framed a face marked by sharp, azure eyes that harbored both intelligence and the spark of potential greatness. He was dressed in the standard Kanoha flak jacket adorned with the symbol of the hidden leaf. Despite the burdens that awaited him in the future, Minato's presence exuded approachability which was something Renjiro had yet to see in anyone since he arrived in this world. It can't be. It's him. Upon seeing him, Renjiro was shocked at his presence. Namike's Minato was his favorite character from the franchise, well apart from Naruto himself. Renjiro inwardly believed that given enough time, Minato would become one of, if not, the strongest shinobi that ever graced the lands. While fully aware that Minato, like any character, had his share of questionable decisions and complexities, Renjiro found himself willing to look past those imperfections. No one was perfect, after all. What is it Renjiro? Kushina's inquiry served as a gentle nudge, pulling Renjiro from the reverie induced by the unexpected presence of Namike's Minato. The abrupt transition from fanboying at Minato to Kushina's question grounded Renjiro in the present moment. Shaking off the residual awe, Renjiro offered a sheepish smile, I, uh, didn't mean to drop by unannounced, he admitted. It's okay Renjiro. It's not like you were interrupting anything. Kushina said as she exchanged glances with Minato. So, did you come to tell me how your first mission went? Collecting his thoughts, Renjiro explained, it was okay. Although the mission rank was upgraded to C rank, it still went well. When we returned to the village I started working on some seals, and I wanted to show you what I've been working on and my progress on it. What? Your mission rank was upgraded? What happened? Renjiro then spent the next half an hour informing both Kushina and Minato about his mission to the land of soups. To say that they were shocked would be an understatement. Anyway, can I show you the seals I just made? Intrigued by Renjiro's mention of his progress, Kushina's eyes sparkled with interest. Yes. I want to see what you've come up with, she said, gesturing for Renjiro to proceed. By the way, Renjiro, this is my friend Minato, she cheerfully announced. Minato extended a friendly greeting, and a warm smile accompanied the words, Hello, Renjiro.it is nice to meet you, Kushina here talks highly of your Fuinjutsu skills. What is there to talk about? I barely know anything about Fuinjutsu. It is also nice to meet you Minato, Renjiro replied. He is only a Chunin now. The gap between us is big, but hopefully, it gets smaller in the future. Kushina's playful pride swelled as she puffed out her chest, as she asked, Did you think you were my only Fuinjutsu disciple, Renjiro? She teased, reveling at the moment before adding, Minato here is also kind of my disciple. At least, for most of the part, she confessed, a hint of a blush coloring her cheeks. Renjiro, attuned to the nuances of the moment, tactfully chose to overlook the blushing, allowing it to remain unspoken. He then changed the subject. Here are the seals that I made. They are all storage seals. I have already tested them and they work as intended, but I wanted to see if there were any mistakes I made when I was making them. As Kushina unfolded the scrolls, her eyes widened in pleasant surprise at the sight of Renjiro seals. Minato, catching a glimpse of the scrolls, couldn't help but be intrigued. His sharp eyes scanned the symbols and patterns. These seals seem ordinary. What's with them? Minato inquired. Ordinary? What do you mean by ordinary? Renjiro was a bit unnerved by Minato's remark, but Kushina beat him to the mark and replied. Renjiro is still in the early stages of his Fuinjutsu journey, she chided, I decided to stick to the common methods for now just to reinforce his basics. We wouldn't want him getting too carried away with the more complex techniques just yet. Minato, with a raised eyebrow and turned to Kushina. So, why didn't you use the same approach with me when I started learning Fuinjutsu, he queried, genuinely interested in understanding the rationale behind the different teaching methods. Kushina responded, Oh, Minato, you already had Jiraiya-sama teaching you the basics before you even came to me. You were already past the stage of needing those conventional methods by the time you became my student. Renjiro observed the interaction between his mentor and Minato. He couldn't help but feel a bit sidetracked. Why are they bickering? I have better things to do than be a third wheel. 
Rinjiro decided to cut straight to the chase. Hey, what were you two talking about and why did Minato say that my seals are ordinary, he inquired. Kushina chuckled, shooting a knowing glance at Minato before turning her attention back to Renjiro to elaborate. You see, Minato expected you to be able to make seals using Uzumaki techniques. You know, those techniques and language that I had earlier told you about. Minato nodded in agreement, yeah, the Uzumaki way is more efficient with its language that consists of intricate symbols. With you being in Uzumaki, I thought that you already knew of these techniques. But, don't get me wrong. These might be ordinary by Uzumaki standards, but they're still great. In fact, basic storage seals like these are always in demand. You could make quite a bit of money with these. The village is always hungry for fuinjutsu, especially when it comes to storage and transportation. Minato Senpai, how much do you think I could make with these seals? Hearing that he could make money from his seals, Renjiro's eyes brightened. Although Renjiro was getting an allowance from the clan, his recent spending to help in his fuinjutsu training brought his funds near the red zone. He would greatly appreciate another stream of money. Considering the recent mission he had he was forced to burn through his stock of weapons. He had initially thought that the money was a lot, but now he wished he got more. Minato, considering the question, leaned back with a thoughtful expression. Well, it depends on various factors, like the size and complexity of the seals, the demand in the market, and your negotiation skills. But I'd say you could fetch about 5,000 Rio for every basic storage. Damn. That was close to the amount of money I got from the mission. And it was a C-rank mission. Why don't people just get into Fuinjutsu? It's such a safe and well-paying career choice. Kushina, sensing the need to redirect the conversation intervened. All right, enough with that. Renjiro. Since you've mastered the basics of storage seals, I have a special seal for you to work on next. She reached into a cupboard and retrieved a seal that seemed more complex than the storage seals Renjiro had just created. Kushina, with a mischievous glint in her eyes, added, Renjiro, the best way for you to understand the effects of this seal is to experience it firsthand. Brace yourself. Huh? Brace myself? Renjiro hesitated for a moment, a sense of apprehension creeping over him. However, it was already too late as Kushina had placed the seal on his arm. Renjiro's eyes widened as fatigue washed over him like a sudden wave, followed by a sharp, shooting pain that coursed through his body. His vision blurred, and before he could comprehend what was happening, darkness enveloped him, pulling him into an unconscious state. Renjiro had passed out. Kushina and Minato exchanged concerned glances, the calm atmosphere vanishing in an instant. Kushina hurriedly moved to support Renjiro, gently laying him on a nearby futon. Kushina's concern deepened as she observed Renjiro unconscious on the futon as the unintended consequence of using an advanced chakra drain seal instead of the basic one she had initially planned. She bit her lower lip, contemplating the potential ramifications of her mistake. What just happened? Minato questioned, his brows furrowed with worry. Minato, this wasn't supposed to happen. I must have grabbed the wrong seal, she said, her tone carrying a mixture of regret and anxiety. I wanted him to experience a basic chakra drain seal, not this advanced one. Recognizing the gravity of the situation, Minato approached Renjiro and quickly removed the seal from his hand. Kushina, we need to find a way to stabilize him. His chakra flow seems disrupted. He is only a genin, so we can't let him endure unnecessary strain on his chakra reserves, especially from such a powerful seal. Kushina nodded. I'll try to counteract the drain with a stabilizing jutsu. We need to restore his chakra balance before any lasting damage occurs. Kushina made a hand sign and put some of the medical ninjutsu that she had learned to use. It wasn't much, but after concentrated effort, she managed to stabilize Renjiro's chakra flow, alleviating the chakra drain that had left him in a state of exhaustion. I should have double-checked, Kushina sighed, a tinge of self-criticism in her voice. Minato placed a reassuring hand on Kushina's shoulder. We all make mistakes. What's crucial is that we learn from them. Renjiro will be fine, from the little I know, he's resilient. After what seemed like an eternity, Renjiro groggily opened his eyes and found himself on the futon. A dull throbbing sensation lingered, and he could sense the remnants of fatigue in every muscle of his body. Slowly sitting up, he looked around, slightly disoriented. 
Why am I in so much pain? It took a moment before Renjiro remembered everything that happened before he passed out. Kushina, who was sitting nearby, turned her attention to Renjiro. Finally. You passed out for a long time and I thought you wouldn't wake up. What happened, he asked, his voice betraying a mixture of confusion and concern. You experienced the effects of an advanced chakra drain seal, Renjiro. It wasn't intentional. I meant to show you a basic chakra drain seal, but I mistakenly used the advanced one. Renjiro frowned, rubbing his forehead as if trying to shake off the remnants of discomfort. Chakra drain? No wonder I feel so tired. Minato, who had been standing by, spoke reassuringly. It was a mistake, Renjiro. We did our best to stabilize your chakra flow. You'll recover soon enough. Kushina nodded, I'm sincerely sorry, Renjiro. Despite the unintended consequences, Renjiro managed a weak smile. It's okay, Sensei. It just caught me off guard. But how does the seal work? Kushina decided to shed light on the specifics of the chakra drain seal. The mechanism behind chakra drain seals is quite fascinating, she began. Essentially, it involves using your own chakra to control the draining rate of your target. The more advanced the seal, either intermediate or advanced, the more control you have over this process. She continued, in the case of the seal I used on you, I thought it was just a basic one, so I didn't initiate the control aspect of it. That's why it drained your chakra so drastically. Renjiro, although initially shocked by the unexpected intensity of the seal, appreciated the explanation. It's actually a good seal. The only shinobi who could survive this are maybe Jinchurikis and other S-ranked ninjas. Wait, I'm getting all this wrong. Since they could change the control to more or less depending on their preference, it means that what I experienced was only the default rate. Since I'm still a genin, with my chakra reserves nearing Chunin, or at least I think they are, Maybe even elite Jounins have a chance of surviving this. This is a foolproof method of subduing enemy ninjas. But why isn't it widespread or even possible in the anime? There must be a catch. Kushina Sensei, I'm surprised by how effective this chakra drain seal can be. But why isn't this widely used or taught if it holds such potential? Kushina leaned back, Renjiro, I first encountered the chakra drain seal when I was just a young Kunoichi back in Yuzushiogakure. The method I learned, however, was a bit unconventional compared to the standard chakra ink and paper done here in Kanoha. She continued, back then, we used our own blood to inscribe the seal. It was a more intimate connection, and the process required a deeper understanding of one's own chakra. It was a difficult and personal experience, but it allowed for a level of efficiency that the chakra ink and paper simply couldn't compare to. Even the chakra ink was invented as an attempt to replicate the effects we get using our blood. This was after other villages discovered that our blood was a bit special. Renjiro's eyes widened at the revelation. Using blood? The only jutsu I remembered that needed one's blood was the summoning jutsu. Although I read something similar in another fandom wiki. I later transitioned to the standard chakra ink and paper method, as it's more widely accepted and less, well, messy, Kushina said with a chuckle. But the essence of the technique remains the same. It requires control and a deep understanding of chakra dynamics. In recent times, with the increasing demand for fuenjutsu, I've been working on recreating some of the sealing techniques I knew and adapting them so that they now use the conventional chakra paper and ink. While I've made progress, it's a challenging task. Some aspects of the original techniques are lost in the process, but I believe it's essential to adapt Fuenjutsu to the needs of the current and following generations. Kushina continued her explanation, the chakra drain seal you experienced, Renjiro, was meant for more than just draining chakra. But now since I am still adapting the techniques to the common methods, it has lost some of its effects. But Sensei, what's so special about the Uzumaki blood? Renjiro asked as he needed to ascertain the effects of the Uzumaki bloodline and pray that he inherited them from his late parents. Kushina chuckled at Renjiro's question, the uniqueness of Uzumaki blood lies in its potent chakra and its inherent vitality. Uzumaki clan members, like myself, possess an extraordinarily rich life force and an affinity for sealing techniques. Our chakra is robust and resilient, making it ideal for intricate and powerful fuenjutsu. 
She went on to explain, the Uzumaki's proficiency in Fuinjutsu has been a legacy passed down through generations. It's not just about the blood, it's the knowledge and experience handed down within the clan. Techniques that were once exclusive to our clan have been refined and shared with the broader shinobi world. As for using blood in seals, Kushina clarified, using blood in Fuinjutsu has a symbolic aspect. It connects the practitioner more intimately with the technique. It's like infusing a part of yourself into the seal, creating a personal link. However, the transition to chakra paper and ink opened up new possibilities for sharing these techniques beyond our clan. If you're interested in delving deeper into the Uzumaki's unique approach, I can share some more advanced techniques that were traditionally passed down within the clan. It might give you a broader perspective on Fuinjutsu, Kushina offered. Yes. That will help a lot, I just hope that I also inherited something from the Uzumaki clan other than the unusually high chakra I currently have. But all this would be in due time. You are still not quite ready. Master the normal way, then we can move to the Uzumaki way. Kushina said as she placed some seals next to Renjiro. Renjiro sat cross-legged on the floor of his room with the books Kushina had given him laid out in front. It was a far cry from the ones he could access in the library. The books were a treasure trove of knowledge, containing a myriad of seals along with the Jinchuriki's personal insights on them. As he perused the pages, Renjiro's eyes were drawn to various symbols and intricate diagrams of the seals. The notes scribbled in the margins by Kushina added a layer of understanding, providing context to the symbols and shedding light on the practical aspects of deploying these seals. Renjiro had gotten a rest day from his daily training with Riku and the team after Riku was informed of what had occurred. Although he had already recovered, they decided not to risk it. Having a whole day of rest was new to Renjiro. Ever since he could remember, he was always training in one way or another. He decided that this day would not be any different. Taking up the book Kushina had given him the previous day, he wanted to hasten his progress in Fuinjutsu so that he would be skilled enough to learn some of the techniques Kushina talked about the previous day. So if I master these seals, I would be considered a basic Fuinjutsu expert? Renjiro pondered. Fuinjutsu practitioners were recognized and classified based on their mastery and proficiency in the art. The hierarchy began with the basic rank. At this stage, individuals familiarize themselves with the fundamental principles, learning basic seals and their applications. Mastery of these essential building blocks forms the foundations for further progression and ranks. As they progress, they advance to the intermediate rank where they refine their understanding of Fuinjutsu, exploring more intricate combinations and applications. This stage marks a pivotal point where practitioners transition from novices to more capable and versatile users of Fuinjutsu. After that, the advanced rank represents a significant leap in a Fuinjutsu user's expertise. At this stage, practitioners command an extensive repertoire of seals, demonstrating mastery over complex techniques. Their understanding of the intricate interplay between symbols and chakra reaches a level where they can tackle formidable challenges with finesse. The master rank is reserved for those who have attained unparalleled proficiency and insight into Fuinjutsu. Masters exhibit a profound understanding of the art, crafting seals with unprecedented intricacy and efficiency. Their expertise extends beyond the practical application of seals, encompassing theoretical knowledge and the ability to innovate within the field. At the pinnacle of Fuinjutsu expertise stands the Grandmaster rank. Those who achieve this prestigious status are revered as living legends. Grandmasters possess an encyclopedic knowledge of seals, effortlessly creating and deciphering even the most intricate designs. Grandmasters often become mentors to other elite Fuinjutsu users and play a vital role in shaping the future of this ancient and powerful discipline. Case in point Jiraiya, Orochimaru, and Kushina. I already know the storage seal so that leaves the chakra drain, paralysis and explosive tag seals. But knowing them would not just cut it. I need to be able to inscribe even in my sleep. Every seal was an amalgamation of six distinct components, each playing a crucial role in the functionality and intricacy of the seal. At the heart of this matrix was Jutsu Shiki, the primary and central component that defined the nature and purpose of the seal. It was different for every seal as it contained the basic intent of the seal storage for storage seals, explosion for explosive tags and so on. It was the most important part of a seal matrix. 
the unique signature of a seal. On top of the Jutsu Shiki were the transfer, linkage, and controller components. These elements form the intricate layers that surround and enhance the Jutsu Shiki. Regardless of the complexity of the seal, there is always a limit to the number of transfer, linkage, and controller components that can be incorporated. This limit is a fundamental constraint that few Injutsu practitioners must navigate as they craft their intricate designs. To complete the seal matrix was the enclosing and unsealing techniques. The enclosing technique allows for the storage of various objects within the confines of the seal. Conversely, the unsealing technique is employed to release what has been stored within the seal, giving the practitioner control over when and how the sealed elements are unleashed. This should be easy since I only need to focus on the Jutsu Shiki. I can always memorize the various controller, transfer and linkage components required for any seal I need to inscribe. Stating all of them is a mouthful, they need a name to group them. Let me just call them auxiliary components. That's a nice fit. Noting down the Jutsu Shiki for the three seals. Rinjiro began studying them. For the explosive tag, the design involved a combination of symbols that encoded the explosive nature of the seal. He noted the careful balance required to ensure controlled detonation and observed the placement of specific characters that dictate the intensity of the explosion. The Jutsu Shiki involved symbols similar to the one used to represent fire. Fire causes explosions, so it is understandable that it would be used here. Does that mean that other elements can be used in the seal? What results would they bring? Deciding that he would pursue that later, Renjiro moved to the Chakra Drain Seal. The Jutsu Shiki for this seal involve patterns that create channels for chakra flow. The symbols used denoted chakra among other unidentified symbols. Going over Kushina's notes, he realized that the symbols meant depletion. For the Paralysis Seal, the Jutsu Shiki governing this seal had a combination of symbols that meant immobilization. Upon close examination, Renjiro saw the similarity between the Jutsu Shiki of the Paralysis and Chakra Drain Seals. Their Jutsu Shiki both contain Chakra, so the Paralysis Seal is probably an advanced form of Chakra Drain. It encompasses the body as opposed to the Chakra Drain that only works on the Chakra Reserves. However, the difference comes in the variation of the auxiliary components. The paralysis seal demands more of the auxiliary components as it has a varied area of effect. After understanding the inner workings of both seals, Renjiro began to work on them, as theoretic knowledge could only take him far. Since all the seal matrices were of the basic variety, he did not have to worry about the effects of the chakra drain and paralysis. For the explosive tag, however, he had to prepare and test them outside his house because an explosion was still an explosion. Is it supposed to be this easy? It wasn't even an hour after he started that Renjiro was able to inscribe the seals perfectly on his first try. He had not even tested them yet, but he began to doubt if he had gotten them right. After counter-checking with the ones from Kushina, he concluded that they were fine and tested them out. However, the initial outcomes fell short of his expectations, leaving him somewhat underwhelmed. The explosive tag failed to achieve the anticipated impact. The chakra drain and paralysis seals left room for improvement, as the envisioned controlled drainage proved more minor than he expected. It's either there seems to be a lack of synchronization between the components or I was overestimating their impacts. Maybe it is because they are just basic seals? But still, I need to find a way to improve them as these are the only seals I can use at the moment. Wanting to improve the seal's performance, Renjiro studied the auxiliary components. After meticulous study, Renjiro experienced an epiphany that guided him towards a unique modification. Focusing on the transfer component, he tweaked some of its properties. Once the modification was complete, Renjiro made an explosive tag with the modified transfer component. The moment of truth arrived as Renjiro activated the explosive tag. It's different. Like some sort of resonance. Renjiro remarked when he witnessed the activation of the seal. He had activated his Sharingan to carefully see the chakra flow and boy was he amazed. The detonation was a more pronounced and forceful blast, indicating a significant improvement over the previous version of the explosive tag. The impact of the tag reverberated in the surrounding environment, leaving Renjiro both satisfied and caught unaware by the explosion. Now that's what I'm talking about! Renjiro yelled as he recovered from the explosion. 
He was too happy to dwell on the destruction that the seal had done to his compound. The modified transfer component amplified the chakra capacity of the seal which improves the potency of the seal. Making even basic seals transcend their normal magnitude. As he assessed the aftermath of the detonation, a realization hit Renjiro. The enhanced impact achieved through the introduction of the modified transfer component indeed showcased promising results. However, the revelation dawned upon him that every advancement came with its own set of trade-offs. The unintended outcome manifested as the tag detonated spontaneously, deviating from the intended functionality. Normally, when one activates the explosion tag, they get the chance to choose when to detonate it over a limited time after activation. The modified tag was different as it did not give Renjiro this chance and detonated spontaneously. It would have been weird if it worked perfectly. Otherwise, other Fuinjutsu experts would have already developed it out by now. Maybe they did but scrambled the idea due to its downsides. This is still good as long as I am fast enough to escape its range. Or find a way to remotely activate the tag. Undeterred by the setback, Renjiro saw the unintended detonation as an opportunity for further exploration and refinement. As he implemented the modified explosive tag once again, the chakra-infused resonance triggered a swift and powerful explosion. However, Renjiro's finely tuned reflexes come into play as he moved with remarkable speed, evading the expanding blast radius. The successful evasion validated his belief that his agility could effectively counterbalance the enhanced explosiveness of the seal. It seems I was right. I am fast enough to escape the range of the explosion. But if can escape so can the Chunin, Jounins, and even Jenins that I will fight. Using this while in combat would be hard considering the pressure I would be facing from my opponents. So it should be saved as a trump card for situations that I really need to escape. With the success of the modified explosive tag, Renjiro's inquisitive nature propelled him to test the altered transfer component on the remaining two seals. As the chakra drain seal was activated, the modified transfer component amplified its draining effect, drawing more chakra than before. However, the downside became evident as Renjiro experienced a slight loss of control during activation. This trade-off between heightened potency and reduced control mirrored the outcome observed with the explosive tag, underscoring the delicate balance required in modifying Fuinjutsu components. Similarly, the paralysis seal, infused with the modified transfer component, exhibited enhanced efficiency in immobilizing the target. The new transfer component contributed to a more potent paralysis, showcasing the potential benefits of Renjiro's modifications. Yet, once again, the compromise manifested as a partial loss of control during the seal's activation. The effects are the same across the board. I need to work on this and improve it. If perfected, Fuinjutsu will never be the same. For starters, it needs a new name. What should I call it? Resonator sounds nice. Looking at the symbols of the modified transfer component, now the resonator, Renjiro was proud as this was his first invention since he transmigrated. Now he hoped for more to come. Satisfied with his progress in mastering basic seals, Renjiro decided that he needed to keep making seals so that he could decrease the time needed to create them. He had big plans of utilizing them in battle. Using shadow clones will make the job easier. The issue is that Riku's training is chakra intensive, so it might put a strain on my reserves. There's no harm in trying so I'll try that for a week and see how it goes. With a puff of smoke five shadow clones appeared to help Renjiro in creating more seals. The five shadow clones shared 70% of his total chakra. Leveraging the aid of his shadow clones, Renjiro embarked on an extensive session of seal creation that extended well into the night. Late into the night, Renjiro dismissed his shadow clones, their purpose fulfilled. After working on countless seals, both modified and normal ones, he decided to call it a night. Under the mid-morning sun in the bustling Kanoha marketplace, Renjiro, armed with a pouch filled with his newly crafted Fuinjutsu seals, made his way to the business district in Kanoha. His targets were shops dealing in ninja tools and techniques. The air was alive with the hum of activity as villagers went about their daily routines, and merchants showcased their array of goods. Approaching the shop, Renjiro greeted the owner with a respectful nod. Good morning, sir. I have some seals that I want to sell. Rengoku, the shop owner, eyed him with curiosity and responded, Seals? 
Let me have a look. Rinjiro carefully unveiled the scrolls, revealing the seals that spoke of the mastery and innovation he had poured into his creations. Here we have storage seals and these explosive tags, Renjiro explained. Rengoku inspected the seals closely, impressive work, but these are only basic seals they would not be going for much, Renjiro replied, I don't mind it at all as long as you buy them at market price. Nodding in agreement, the shop owner pondered for a moment. All right then, I will take two dozen of each with 3,000 Rio for the storage seals and 2,000 Rio for the explosive tags. Why is he trying to take advantage of me? Good thing I already did my research. It should at least be 5,000 Rio for the storage seals and 4 for the explosive tags. It's fine sir, thank you for your time, Renjiro said as he packed up his scrolls. Why are you leaving? Rengoku asked. I had already researched the market price for both seals. What you are offering is way below them. It seems that you are fine with scamming kids. Kids my foot. If he was really a kid, then he would have taken the deal. Then how much do you want for the seals? 6,000 Rio for the storage seals and 5,000 for the explosive tags. I'll give you 4,000 Rio for the storage seals, and 3,000 Rio for the explosive seals. Have a good day sir, okay, okay, 5,000 for the storage seals and 4,000 seals. You have a deal, sir. Rengoku's eye twitched as he heard Renjiro. This brat. How is this any different from my other suppliers? Without further ado, they transacted the items with Renjiro getting a huge sum of 96,000 Rio. As the transaction concluded, Renjiro left the shop, his mind buzzing with a sense of accomplishment. Inasmuch as that was a huge sum of money, Renjiro had a lot of things that he needed to financially cater for. First, he needed to bolster his upkeep money as the inn he was receiving from the clan took a significant reduction when he became a genin. They said that since he was now qualified to earn money from missions, he did not need much from the clan. Secondly, he was saving up for his weapon. Earlier he had decided to start using the staff, or bois as it was widely known. For his weapon, he had talked to the clan weapon master about some modifications like having it bore blades at both ends and the ability to separate into two distinct bladed batons. He wanted these modifications to add versatility to his fighting style. However, these modifications did not come cheap. Especially when Renjiro wanted the blades to be made of chakra metal. This would make it more durable as well as give Renjiro the avenue of using chakra flow with the weapons. In total that would cost him a cool 250,000 Rio. That much? Why did I choose to become a shinobi? I should have found a cheaper career. Renjiro was shocked when he heard the price and tried his level best to haggle for it but the weapon master would not budge. When it came to chakra metal, he never compromised. Fortunately for him, a door opened for him as during one of their training sessions Riku declared, I am sure you have had plenty of rest so prepare yourselves, Tomorrow we'll take our second mission. The next morning, Riku, Renjiro, Aiko, and Hiro rose with the sun and made their way to the mission center. The moment they arrived at the mission center, they noticed Mahito engrossed in sorting through various mission scrolls. Riku, with his typical straightforward demeanor, approached Mahito to inquire about missions involving bandits. Mahito looked up, a familiar twinkle of recognition in his eyes. Riku! It's been quite some time since I last saw you, how are you? Mahito greeted them with a bright smile on his face. Riku grinned in response. I am good Mahito. My team has had enough rest and could use a challenge. Do you have any preference? I think dealing with bandits will help them test themselves. Mahito chuckled, shuffling through the scrolls in his hands. Well, it seems you're in luck today. We've had numerous reports of increased bandit activity in the bordering regions. Here, you can take a look and pick a mission of your choice. Mahito handed Riku a selection of mission scrolls, each detailing a different bandit-related assignment. Riku glanced through them, his eyes scanning the details with a discerning focus. These should keep your team occupied for a while, Mahito commented. Should I take more than one mission so that we could clear them at once? No. Maybe once they get more mission exposure. The last mission may have gone well despite the unexpected incident, but that may have been beginner's luck. They have not been tested enough, Riku pondered. After carefully reviewing the assortment of mission scrolls, Riku's gaze fixated on one particular assignment that stood out, a mission to the land of mountains. 
The details outlined a concerning situation regarding reports of a group of rogue ninjas wreaking havoc in the region, posing a significant threat to the safety of the local civilians. It was a mission that resonated with what he wanted his genins to learn. We've got a mission to the land of mountains, Riku announced, his voice carrying a tone of seriousness. There is a group of rogue ninjas causing trouble, and our task is to investigate and eliminate the threat. We will leave as soon as we've made the necessary preparations. Finish your final preparations and meet me at the gate. As the team dispersed to prepare for the mission, Riku couldn't shake the gravity of the task ahead. Rogue ninjas, the rugged terrain and hidden valleys would present a challenging backdrop for their mission. When the team reconvened at the village gate, Riku noticed the determined expressions on their faces and advised, We don't know what we're walking into, so stay sharp and watch each other's backs. With that, the team embarked on their journey towards the land of mountains. The journey to the land of mountains took them through unfamiliar landscapes and territories. Since the land of mountains didn't share a direct border with the land of fire, the team had to navigate through the land of tea to reach their destination. The lush scenery of the land of tea, with its rolling hills and vibrant greenery, provided a picturesque backdrop to their travels. As they traversed the land, the team maintained a vigilant watch, wary of any signs of potential threats or disturbances. They seemed to have learned from their past. Aiko, Hiro, and Renjiro moved in sync, their training and teamwork evident in the seamless coordination of their movements. Their training sessions had been going great with them showing significant improvements. They had even managed to secure a win against Riku during one of their spars. It was a stark contrast to the number of losses they had suffered against their sensei, but a win is a win nonetheless. This improvement enabled them to keep up with the high pace that Riku had employed since the journey to the land of mountains would take around three days of travel. The journey was not without its share of encounters, as the team faced occasional wildlife and encountered fellow travelers along the way. However, due to the nature of their mission, they avoided pedestrian routes. Riku took advantage of these moments to engage the team in brief training exercises, sharpening their reflexes and keeping them in a state of readiness. As they approached the border between the land of tea and the land of mountains, Riku called for a brief halt. The landscape began to change, the gentle slopes transforming into more rugged terrain. The air carried a different energy, hinting at the mysteries concealed within the mountainous region ahead. Listen up, Riku addressed his students. We're about to enter the land of mountains. Stay alert and be prepared for anything. We'll first head to Osaka, the capital, to have an audience with the daimyo. After that, we'll coordinate an attack on the bandits with his security detail. The team nodded in acknowledgement, their expressions reflecting a combination of focus and determination. In no time, they neared Osaka. It is quite a good city. With the ambience and all. You would think that with the terrain, it would be somewhat bleak. Renjiro surmised. Osaka, the capital city of the land of mountains, welcomed them with a blend of traditional architecture and bustling activity. As they entered the city, the distinct sounds of market vendors haggling, the aroma of local cuisine wafting through the air, and the sight of vibrant banners adorning the streets greeted them. The city, though not as sprawling as some of the major nations, held a unique charm with its rich cultural heritage. Their destination was the residence of the daimyo, the ruling leader of the land of mountains. The daimyo's estate stood at the heart of Osaka, a testament to the nation's history and governance. Upon reaching the daimyo's estate, the team was ushered through ornate gates. They were received by the daimyo's attendants, who informed them that an audience had been arranged. Inside the grand hall, the daimyo awaited, seated on a raised platform adorned with intricate carvings. Welcome, honored shinobi of Kono, the daimyo greeted, I am grateful for Konoha accepting our mission. Your presence here is greatly appreciated. Riku stepped forward, offering a respectful bow. Thank you for receiving us, Daimyo-sama. Any information you can provide about the situation would be valuable. The Daimyo nodded, acknowledging the gravity of the mission at hand. Reports have reached my ears of rogue ninjas causing unrest in the outskirts of our villages and towns. Their actions have sown fear among our people. I entrust this mission to you, with the help of my trusted ninjas, to investigate the matter, identify the source of the threat, and take appropriate action to safeguard our citizens. Riku replied with a firm nod. Rest assured, Daimyo-sama, we will carry out our duty with diligence. 
With the daimyo's blessings and a clear mission directive, Team 25 exited the hall, their minds focused on the task ahead. Aoi Miwato, the seasoned jounin and head of security for the Land of Mountains, awaited Team 25 in a strategic briefing room within the daimyo's estate. Hmm? They only sent one team? And one filled with genins? Aoi's brows scrunched up when Riku and his team entered the room. In the stillness of the night, Hozuki Tao, a seasoned and battle-hardened shinobi, found himself restless. His usual calm demeanor was replaced by an undercurrent of unease that twisted through his thoughts like a shadowy serpent. The moon's silvery glow bathed his bed, yet its serene light failed to dispel the haunting premonitions that lingered in the air. Tao's mind, which was usually sharp and focused, was now clouded with a foreboding sense of the unknown. The recent raids they had, successful as they were, failed to soothe the disquiet within him. The surrounding villages and towns, victims of their calculated strikes, offered little solace. It was as if a subtle discord resonated beneath the surface of their victories. The weight of his thoughts pressed upon him like an unseen burden and his instincts, finely tuned from years of experience, whispered warnings that transcended the tangible realm of battle. In the silent moments between each twist of his body on the bed, Tao's mind raced through the myriad possibilities. Was it a prelude to a greater threat? A harbinger of unforeseen challenges? The abstract nature of his disquiet left him grappling with uncertainties that defied rational explanation. Together with his elder brothers, Yagi and Kojima, they were once proud members of the esteemed Hozuki clan, renowned for their distinct water-based techniques. Unfortunately for the trio, they faced a turning point that shattered the very foundations of their lives. The pivotal moment arrived when they undertook an ill-fated mission, the assassination of the formidable White Fang of Kanoha. The mission proved to be a formidable challenge, and the brothers found themselves on the losing end. Sakumo thwarted their attempts, turning their actions into a haunting failure. The repercussions of this failure were great, staining their once illustrious name with shame. The brothers were expelled from their clan and cast out. Even their familial ties to Genjetsu Hozuki, the second Mizukage and their great uncle, failed to shield them from the harsh judgment of the clan elders. Faced with the irreparable damage to their honor, the trio chose the path of rogue ninjas, abandoning the village that had once been their home. The decision to become rogue ninjas marked the beginning of their journey as bandits, away from the structured life they had previously known. The land of mountains, with its rocky cliffs and dense forests, provided ample cover for their base of operations as they were seeking to remain hidden from the prying eyes of the shinobi world. Or at least they tried to. As Tao was reminiscing about the past, his heightened senses picked up on a subtle disturbance within his activated chakra field. Years of living on the edge as a rogue ninja had honed his instincts, and the ever-present threat of being hunted had become a constant companion. Paranoia and a survival instinct dictated his actions, and he rarely let his guard down, even in the supposed safety of their hidden sanctuary. Someone is coming. Tao sat up in his makeshift bed, he used chakra on his eyes making them glow as they darted around the dimly lit cave, searching for any signs of intrusion. His brothers, Yagi and Kojima, were roused from their slumber by Tao's sudden alertness. What is wrong Tao? Yagi inquired. Tao's hand instinctively reached for the hilt of his kunai, a reflex honed by the constant awareness of imminent danger. I have sensed someone see Dash, Tao's attempt to inform his brothers was drowned out by sudden tremors and the deafening roar of the collapsing cave. Rocks and debris began to rain down, obscuring the already dimly lit space with dust and disarray. With a final, thunderous groan, the cave succumbed to the relentless assault, sealing the trio, alongside other ninjas under them, within its stony embrace. Seventeen hours earlier, Chaoi Miwato gestured towards the tactical maps, indicating various points of interest. The rogue ninjas have been operating in the border regions, avoiding confrontation with our forces. Villages on the outskirts have reported attacks, thefts, murder, rape, and disruptions in their daily lives. We believe they are using guerrilla tactics, making them elusive. Renjiro, Aiko, and Hiro listened attentively, absorbing the details of the situation. Aoi Miwato continued, our scouts have identified three potential locations where the rogue ninja might be hiding. However, we lack the manpower to launch simultaneous attacks. This is where your team comes in. We need to launch coordinated attacks simultaneously and eliminate the threat swiftly and decisively. 
Riku nodded in understanding. Understood, Aoi Miwato-sama. We will work with your forces to ensure a coordinated effort. If you can provide any specific details about the rogue ninja's abilities as well as their number and composition, that would help. Aoi Miwato shared his knowledge, the rogue group consisted of one or two jounins, twenty chunins and numerous genins. All these figures were a rough estimate as the knowledge was derived from speculations. With that number, do they expect this to be a deranked mission? This is a complete force and we only arrived at Jounin and three Genins. Rinjiro was surprised when he heard the approximate figure of the enemy forces. He hoped that the forces from Osaka had countless Chunins otherwise, there would be no need to undertake this mission. They seem to favor elemental ninjutsu, particularly water-based techniques. Together with me, we have 12 Chunins, 20 Genins and 1 Jounin. I am sure with your help we will be more than enough to eliminate those scums. They decided to split their forces into three groups. Two groups would be led by a Jounin while the last one with an elite Chunin. Elite Chunins were at the cusp of the Chunin ranks but their expertise in one of their abilities propelled them to a pseudo Jounin rank. Since one of the three presumed locations was a significant distance from the two, Aoi would attack it and Riku would attack the remaining two. Renjiro was confident he could take the two Yanis or in the worst case scenario, hold them off till Aoi returned. They agreed to attack the next day since Team 15 was still fatigued from their long journey. They spent the whole day resting and preparing for the ambush. At night, the teams dispersed each heading towards their designated target zones. As they approached the target area, Riku signaled for the team to halt. We need to proceed with caution. The rogue ninja might be aware of our presence. Try your best to erase your chakra signatures. The last statement was mainly directed to his genins as he was sure were not yet qualified to perform it flawlessly, all apart from Renjiro. This was a technique they learned recently, and they were still getting the ropes of it. They quietly reached their targets when Riku stopped them and went further ahead. Riku's hands moved swiftly through a series of hand seals. As his palms slammed onto the ground, a powerful jutsu was unleashed. The earth beneath the team's feet responded violently, sending shockwaves through the ground. The peaks surrounding their location quivered as the earth itself seemed to groan in response to the jutsu's activation. Massive rocks and boulders tumbled down the slopes, creating a cascade of obstacles for the Rue Shinobi. Great tremor jutsu. Riku muttered. Damn. He is a walking calamity. Actually most Jounin and above Shinobi are. Rinjiro surmised as he watched the situation unfold. He had made a habit of activating his Sharingan whenever a ninjutsu was used. It was informative as it gave Renjiro a whole different perspective on how ninjutsu worked. Renjiro was definitely not trying to copy the jutsus he saw. This should limit their mobility and confine them. Let's move in and secure the targets. Hearing that, the shinobi behind him adjusted their positions, ready to engage any rogue ninjas attempting to escape the cascading rocks. The dust settled, revealing the altered terrain and the remnants of the once towering peaks. A Chunin sensor yelled, they are some who are still alive, brace yourselves, he urged his team members to stay alert. Soon enough, a group of rogue ninjas limped out of the collapsed terrain. Their bodies bore the marks of the cascading rocks. Despite the damage, the surviving rogue Shinobi Hinobi showed a determination to resist capture. Renjiro activated his Sharingan and Chakra field, focusing on the chakra signatures of the emerging adversaries. His eyes widened as something hit him. They've got three Jounins. He couldn't help but blurt out loud. There are Kanoha scums. Kojima spat as he immediately recognized Riku standing with the opposing force. Due to their past, it was understandable why they would hate Kanoha as its very own shinobi who was the author of their fall from grace. Fortunately, he and his brothers had managed to use jutsus to traverse the earth right before the collapse. Why are they so few? Tao wondered when he only sensed one jounin from the forces that had just attacked them. Anyway, this just makes it easier to escape. Analyzing the situation, Tao thought it was better for them to escape and cut their losses while they still had a chance. The aftermath of the Great Tremor Jutsu had killed a majority of their forces. The casualties included mostly Genins and some Chunins. As Tao was just about to start flickering away, he noticed something. His brothers were no longer next to him. He looked around and saw them heading towards the opposing force. Why are they always like this? 
He sighed as he joined them. He only did so as he was encouraged by their growing advantage. Back at the Allied group, Renjiro had only spoken what almost everyone was thinking. Facing more than one Jounin put them in a disadvantaged position. Riku, who was standing at the forefront, assessed the situation with a keen eye. The rogue ninjas, though battered, still posed a potential threat. Be on guard. Assume defensive formation. Riku shouted the minute he saw two of the Jounins heading towards him. Maintaining a heightened state of vigilance, everyone headed to his words. They were all aware of the stakes at hand. Following their bosses, the surviving Chunins and Jenins also rushed towards the enemies. Making this a full-blown battle between the two sides. With a sudden burst of movement, the rogue ninjas unleashed a series of desperate attacks. Their resilience and determination fueled their attempts. A clash of jutsus erupted, marked by flashes of chakra and the sound of colliding techniques. Team 15 and the rest, guided by Riku, responded swiftly to the renewed threat. I need to hold them off till Aoi arrives. He must have already noticed all this commotion. The elite Chunin is only a censor, so I can't expect him to handle one of the brothers. That will be like showing my back to the enemy. Riku faced the Hozuki brothers, skilled and formidable opponents with a lineage deeply connected to water-based techniques. Meanwhile, Aiko, Hiro, and the Land of Mountains forces confronted the surviving Chunins and Jenins. As the Hozuki brothers unleashed their Kekiai Genkai, Hydrification, Riku found himself confronted with a formidable challenge. The ability to transform their bodies into liquid water granted the brothers a unique form of defense and evasion, turning the tide of the battle, and, forward slash forward slash I swear no pun intended, in their favor. Riku, recognizing the need to adapt, intensified his focus on earth-based techniques. Stalactites and rock formations became his weapons of choice, manipulated with precision to counter the fluidity of the Hozuki brothers. Yes, earth nature was strong against water nature, but when you are up against three experts in water nature, it's easy to be forced into a defensive position. The brothers, however, proved to be elusive targets. Their mastery of hydrification allowed them to effortlessly evade Riku's attacks, slipping through the rocky projectiles with liquid grace. This is getting hard. What the hell is keeping Aoi? I'm sure the location was empty. Riku lamented as he analyzed their movements and sought to exploit openings in their defense. The Hozuki brothers aimed to wear down Riku's defenses, while Riku sought opportunities to land decisive blows while still defending. Riku's ability to withstand the onslaught of the Hozuki brothers stemmed from a combination of factors. His power levels were on the cusp of reaching the pinnacle of Jounin ranks, and he was teetering on the precipice of ascending to the coveted S-rank status. This was a rare rank. Besides the tailed beasts, they were the deterring power of every shinobi village. The brothers, though formidable jounins in their own right, faced a seasoned warrior on the verge of significant promotion. Kanoha's strict criteria for jounin advancement meant that those jounin rank possessed a level of skill and experience that surpassed the standard expectations. Riku was only on the defensive because he was not sure if he could take on the three of them offensively without sacrificing the lives of the chunins and jenins with him. He was waiting for Aoi to arrive and take on one of them so that they could end this matter. On the other side of the now battleground, Renjiro found himself engaged in a fierce duel with a Chunin from the opposing force. He was not confident in facing a Chunin in combat, but considering their current predicament, he had to. The enemy forces had a majority of Chunin surviving as opposed to Jenins. While Renjiro and his allies had a majority of Jenins as opposed to Chunins. They did have an elite Chunin with them. But he couldn't take on all the enemy Chunins, so Renjiro decided to face a Chunin so that the rest could quickly finish the enemy Jenins and aid him. The Chunin launched a relentless assault, showcasing a combination of Taijutsu and Elemental Jutsu. Renjiro, aware of the significant difference in their ranks, knew that he had to leverage his skills and resourcefulness to overcome this challenge. The Chunin unleashed a barrage of water Jutsus, forcing Renjiro to swiftly maneuver through the onslaught. Renjiro had to resort to Taijutsu and dodging the incoming attacks since his fire and wind Jutsus wouldn't do much damage to the Chunin. I wish I learned Earth Jutsus, they would have really helped in this situation. Despite the Chunin's proficiency in water Jutsus, Renjiro's Sharingan-enhanced reflexes allowed him to anticipate and evade the majority of the attacks. 
As the fight drew on, Renjiro began experiencing a surge of emotions and sensations that he didn't fully understand. Wait. Why do I feel so? Alive? Is that the feeling? Renjiro was confused. The clash of steel and the urgency of combat all combined to create a feeling of vitality that coursed through his veins. Despite the perilous situation, Renjiro found himself embracing the challenge, savoring the thrill of the fight. The adrenaline rush heightened his senses, making every movement more vivid and every decision more crucial. Renjiro's heart pounded in rhythm with the chaos around him. His instincts guided him with an almost primal precision. With each movement, he flowed seamlessly through the battlefield, a blur of speed and precision. With this, he went from dodging and defending to fully attacking his opponent. The enemy Chunin now found it increasingly challenging to keep up with Renjiro's wild yet controlled maneuvers. In a burst of accelerated movements, he outmaneuvered his adversary, exploiting an opening in their defense. The sound of metal meeting flesh echoed as Renjiro's kunai met its mark, severing the connection between his opponent and the world of the living. Finishing him off, Renjiro surged forward, traversing the battlegrounds with calculated chaos to new opponents. Finishing off the Chunin made him bolder. He moved ahead to other Chunins with his strikes becoming more precise and devastating. The foes before him fell like leaves in a storm. The feeling that had initially gripped him intensified, propelling him forward. Renjiro's Sharingan captured every detail of the chaotic environment. Following the trail of destruction left by him, some Chunins took the initiative and closed in on him. His comrades tried their best to stop them but some still managed to get to Renjiro. They only had one thing on their minds. Ending Renjiro's rampage amongst their ranks. Good. Come to me. Renjiro, fueled by the exhilaration of the battle, entertained a daring idea as the Chunins closed in on him. In a swift motion, his hands danced through a series of seals, culminating in the manifestation of countless explosive tags. Yes. He had summoned all explosive tags he had from his storage seals. These were not ordinary explosive tags, they were the modified version Renjiro had ingeniously devised to enhance their impact. In a heartbeat, Renjiro flickered away. The tags erupted in a cascade of explosions, transforming the battleground into a chaotic display of fiery brilliance. The Chunins, caught off guard, found themselves engulfed in a tempest of destructive blast. Renjiro's modified explosive tags lived up to their enhanced potential, magnifying the devastation and scattering the remnants of the opposing force. From a vantage point at a considerable distance, Aoi Miwato observed the sudden eruption of explosions on the battlefield. Intrigued and vigilant, Aoi squinted to get a clearer view of the situation, analyzing the aftermath of the explosive spectacle. What the hell is happening over there? I need to hurry up. I already wasted time going to the fake hideout. Propelled by a sense of urgency and a commitment to the mission's success, Aoi hastened his pace as he approached the heart of the ongoing battle. Upon reaching the epicenter of the conflict, Aoi's discerning gaze swiftly identified Riku, engaged in a formidable struggle against the Hozuki brothers. The confrontation had reached a critical juncture, and Aoi understood the importance of reinforcing the efforts against the adversaries. Finally, two against three. Seems fair to me. Relief washed over Riku as he witnessed the arrival of Aoi Miwato. The intensity of the conflict against the Hozuki brothers was straining him, and Aoi's reinforcement brought a renewed sense of assurance. As Aoi now engaged with one of the Hozuki brothers with his earth-based jutsus, Riku seized the opportunity to shift the battle dynamics. Lightning crackled in the air as Riku unleashed his mastery of lightning techniques. Riku's versatility extended beyond his primary chakra affinities of water and earth. Drawing upon his extensive training and expertise, he demonstrated proficiency in multiple chakra natures, showcasing a well-rounded skill set that spoke to his status as a seasoned jounin. He had not mastered all the chakra natures like the Hokage, but he was lightning released due to its offensive capabilities. Using earth nature jutsus would be the better option. But no, Riku wanted his opponents to suffer for all the troubles they had caused him during the short time that they had been fighting. With a hand seal, Riku summoned a barrage of shurikens. Lightning release, aftershock. Riku's voice echoed through. The atmosphere itself seemed to quiver in response, as bolts of lightning danced along the edges of the thrown projectiles. The charged shurikens zipped through the air with enhanced speed and precision, 
guided by Riku's control. Trails of lightning arced behind them, leaving a dazzling display in their wake. The brothers, caught in the crosshairs, reacted with a mixture of surprise and determination. The youngest brother, Tao, recognized the imminent threat posed by the charging weapons. Get ready! Tao bellowed a directive aimed at his brothers as they, too, prepared to weather the storm of electrified projectiles. The moment of impact unleashed a dazzling display of arcing lightning, illuminating the battlefield with a flickering brilliance. The Hozuki brothers, shielded by their resilient water transformation, absorbed the brunt of the electrical assault. The shurikens were so many that they didn't even consider evading them. Seizing the advantageous moment when the Hozuki brothers were momentarily stunned by the unforeseen repercussion of the lightning assault and experienced a lapse in their hydrification technique, Riku's form blurred as he flickered and closed in on Tao. The lapse in their techniques turned their bodies back to normal. With a swift and calculated strike, Riku's hands, now infused with lightning chakra, made contact with Tao's torso. The jolt of lightning chakra surged through Tao's system. He had used the dance of lightning jutsu. Tao was unable to turn back to liquid form in time and his innards were electrocuted, killing him before he could realize what was happening. One down. Riku thought as he turned to face the remaining two enemy jounins. No! Yagi screamed as Tao staggered and fell to the ground, the two Hozuki brothers found themselves grappling with the fact that their brother had gotten an express ticket to the afterlife. You will pay for this. Kojima said as he and his brother were visibly consumed by an overwhelming surge of emotions. With their eyes ablaze with a mix of grief and rage, released an ominous killing intent that permeated the air. The very air seemed to thicken with the weight of their unbridled emotions. Good. This is what I wanted. The third brother was the level-headed one. With these two now angry, things could get easier. In unison, Yagi and Kojima shouted, Water release, great water arm. As their voices resonated, an immediate transformation overcame the Hozuki brothers. The ambient moisture in the air responded to their chakra, coalescing around their limbs. The metamorphosis was a sight to behold. The muscles on their arms expanded and swelled, pulsating with an otherworldly vitality. What were once ordinary limbs now bore the hallmark of chakra-infused augmentation. Simultaneously, Yagi and Kojima locked eyes with Riku, their expressions hardened and determined. Riku met their intense gaze with a steely resolve. Impressive technique, he remarked, his words cutting through which only made the brothers angry. The decision to forego their signature clan technique in favor of raw power became evident in the sinewy strength that emanated from their water-infused arms. It was also a calculated move as their chakra reserves were dwindling, so they opted for a less chakra-intensive jutsu. As the confrontation shifted from a battle of elements to a physical clash, Yagi and Kojima engaged Riku in a melee of raw power, their water-infused strikes aiming to overpower the seasoned Jounin. Their strength is similar to the princess. In response, Riku seamlessly transitioned into a taijutsu stance, meeting the brothers head-on with a combination of speed, precision, and martial expertise. He could not help but compare their strength to a certain blonde lady from his clan. While Riku faced the brothers in close combat, Aoi took on a supportive role. His earth jutsu served as disruptions to the fluid movements of the Hozuki brothers, creating obstacles and barriers that impeded their progress. Riku, despite facing adversaries with augmented strength, showcased the artistry of taijutsu, a blend of evasion, counterattacks, and strategic positioning. Aoi's earth jutsus, strategically placed, disrupted the fluidity of the Hozuki brothers' attacks, providing crucial openings for Riku to exploit. Riku expertly dodged the brothers' powerful strikes, finding openings in their attacks to deliver calculated and devastating blows. Drawing from his extensive combat history, Riku exploited the weaknesses in their approach, capitalizing on his agility and technique. Coupled with his vast chakra reserves and superior taijutsu, the brothers started to lag as their reserves dwindled. Riku had won this somewhat battle of attrition. The battlefield resonated with the sounds of impacts as Riku's strikes found their mark. The brothers, despite their enhanced strength, now struggled to match Riku's finesse and strategic approach. In a final series of swift and calculated movements, Riku incapacitated the brothers, after exploiting their vulnerabilities and dismantling their offensive capabilities. 
The clash of elements and martial skill reached its conclusion as Riku emerged victorious, showcasing the effectiveness of superior taijutsu against overwhelming strength. After finishing off the brothers, Riku stored the three bodies in a scroll and, together with Aoi, they surveyed the aftermath of the battle. As they approached the area where Renjiro and the rest of the groups had been engaged in battle, the gravity of the situation became apparent. And that concludes this episode. If you enjoyed it, I'd seriously love it if you guys could leave a like on the video as it genuinely helps out so much, and it keeps me going, plus it takes only one second. That said, have a wonderful day. See you in the next one.